Hello and welcome to the Game Informer Show. I am your host. My name is Ben Hansen, and I'm joined always by my permanent co-host, Timothy Turry. Hi, Ben Hansen. Hi, everybody <laughs> listening and watching. <laughs> Very exciting. We also have old returning champion, Jeff Cork. Yay! There we go. Uh, if you're not watching the video version of this, everyone's flailing around. Oh like my Kermit, god! Really? And then we also have Brian Shea. Yes, you do. Hey, everyone. For the second week in a row. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, it's a streak I don't want to break. That's right. No. Tip of the cat. What man. cursed amulet do you have? It's going to come back at you. <laughs> I thought my gesture was the worst, and then Shea did this. I, I had no idea. What to, I was very confused what I should do with my hands there. And yeah, it's, it's all right. I should have just left fold them, them the and table. then hunch over. If That's you want to the... know about these gestures, listen and watch the <laughs> the Game Informer Show podcast on YouTube, everybody. It's good yeah. stuff. So we have these two jokers here this week to cover two big games, two Nintendo games. Uh, we got Brian Shea, because he's been playing a hell of a lot of Splatoon, which just came out. And then also one Jeff Cork mm -hmm. for Puzzle and Dragon Z Edition Super Mario Brothers 18. Hyper fighting. Hyper fighting. <laughs> yes. Alpha. Correct. You got it. So we're going to be covering those two games and then to make up for the Nintendo 64 spectacular last week where we had all N64 questions. This week we're going to have a gigantic reader mailbag and try and get through some of those old ones that we missed out on last time so that everything was theoretically N64 focused. Yeah. But we appreciate the good feedback on the N64 episode. We had a good time with that. So I'd imagine we return to it at some point with different consoles and whatnot. Yeah, that was a that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Got a lot of good feedback from that one. Yeah, definitely. So to kick things off, Brian Shea, yes. let's talk about this uh, Splatoon game. Sure. Uh, so yeah, it's the new game from Nintendo coming out on Wii U this Friday. Um, it is a third-person shooter action kind of game. Okay. But like, how many how many like of your shooter skills carried through into this game? Um, not a ton. I mean, okay. I guess my strategy kind of did, but then the game kind of puts a different take on like what your objectives are. Like instead of just going out and killing everyone, you're going out and coating an entire map with your color of ink. Um, so you take control of these inklings, and you you can transform into squids, which is a really weird thing if you like are hearing this for the first time. Like, oh, you change into squids, but sure. We, a Nintendo we, game where you transform into something? <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> Click. So you can jump into puddles of ink that are your character's colors or your team's right. colors and then swim like super fast. And uh, kind of like we talked about last week where like Mario and Mario 64 was like super fun to control. I feel like Nintendo kind of reached that same point with how they control when they're squids. Like, it's just really fun to control these the things. The Squidmen. Yeah, the Squidmen. Well, I think they're just called squid, like, when they're in that form, but, like, they're inklings. Brian, as they're... did you just say that Splatoon is Nintendo's best game since Mario 64? Because <laughs> it's all I'm hearing. Let's not go that far, okay. but, uh, yeah, it's it's fun to control. Um, there are some minor issues that get in the way of it, uh, some more minor than others, but... Yeah, so we kind of know, like, the, the overall premise for this thing, but... Is this a good game or a bad game, Brian Shea? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's a pretty good game. I, I okay. enjoyed it. Um, like I said, there are some issues with it. Uh, mostly the game just gets in its own way. Like it. Uh, tentacles? Yeah, the, the tentacles are just everywhere. and, and uh, But it's it's pretty everywhere? much everywhere. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the, the single player is pretty awesome. But uh, okay. when you're in the multiplayer, like they're, they're quick three-minute rounds in the regular battle. So, like, after that, it just kicks you right back out to the matchmaking lobby, which is fine, because then it just shoots you back into a match as soon as you, as soon as you have a team of four on each side. So okay. the loop, you constantly feel like you're being thrown in another game. Like, there's never a right time to step back out of things. Like, Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's, at the end of each match, it says, hey, do you want to battle again? You're like, yes or no, and it kicks you back into the matchmaking. If you say yes, it, if you say no, it kicks you back to, like, the menu. Okay. But, like, you, if you say yes and you want to stick with your same group, you can't switch your weapon or your loadout or anything. It's You have huh. to actually back out. So, like, I was with a really good group one time, and I was like, I want to keep playing with these guys, but I don't want to use this same weapon anymore. So I had to back out, and I was like, well, I'm like, hopefully I'll get back in with these guys, and I didn't. Huh. So does it kind of just feel like Nintendo's learning curves for what's become kind of standard for shooters throughout the market? Yeah, like, I mean, in Call of Duty and stuff, like, when you're waiting for the next match to start, you can kind of, like, customize your class. You can right. change your loadout if you want. You change can even change your loadout on the, go, on the go. Like, you know, yeah, yeah. You can, well, the ink color is something that's set uh, oh, I see. by the team. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's it's a fun game. Gets in its way a little bit. Uh, the single player, I found a lot of like Mario influence within it. Um, yeah, we saw that test chamber a little while ago, and Nintendo came to the office, and it seemed pretty cool. More ambitious than just kind of you know fighting bots, which is kind of what I was imagining. That's what I was thinking we were going to get to, and I started it up, and it was like you know like actually fully fleshed out levels. You make your way from point A to point B. Okay. You kind of 
fly around mm. from like <laughs> I can get used to that <laughs> you fly around um and you like kind of like in mario galaxy like like it, it almost has that feel of like the level design and um so there's a creative level design but is just not much there like is there any reason somebody should buy this if they're only interested in like i like nintendo's platformers i like the level of polish should i just get Splatoon for the single player stuff? I would say that as an experience, it's it's a great single player experience, but I don't think there's enough there. Like sure. there's 27 stages, I would say it took me like 5 or 6 hours to oh. to beat. Are you from like start to unlocking stuff that carries over into multiplayer then? Uh you can. You can find like hidden scrolls and like they mm. like some of them have blueprints that you can take back to the shop and they'll build like variants on weapons that you can unlock through other means like Hey, this is like a machine gun that's the, exactly like the one you already have, but you come with it comes with a different grenade and it comes with a different super weapon that you can okay. use. Okay, so you mentioned blueprints. How about orange prints? Not, uh, man. I don't know. I've I had the the colorblind mode on the whole time. So oh, okay, perfect. Gotcha. <laughs> super smart. It is just orange and blue, right? Isn't that the two? Inks? No, it's 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 orange, blue, pink, teal, like what? purple, royal blue, oh, royal man. blue versus blue. Everybody, <laughs> <laughs> wow, get, get ready. So this game seems really charming for the thing I've seen. Like they have like uh, the judge after each match is like this fat cat named Judd that like waddles out onto the screen and like just the overall color and atmosphere of the game seems really entertaining. Is that a level of presentation that's carried throughout the entire experience? Yeah, and like the the presentation, like I never really got sick of it. Like some of the soundtrack gets like it wears on you a little bit. Okay, Brian, pop quiz. <laughs> what is the main theme to Splatoon? How does it go? Oh my god. Is it god. memorable? It it actually is pretty. Uh, I mean, okay. the, the music itself. Like, I I've had like three songs from Splatoon just stuck in my head on like constant loop, and it's just it. it I'm in hell right Can now. Can you compare? So I like Nintendo music a lot. Sure. I've been listening a little bit to Splatoon stuff, um, just what I've heard, and it seems just sort of scattered. It seems a little all over the place. Mm -hmm. How does I think, it I stack think you up said, against? Tim, to be fair, you described it as Koji Kondo's cat jumping around on a keyboard. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, <laughs> some, some of some like, of the loops a synthesizer, really. But no, but can you compare it to any other kind of Nintendo music, or mm. is it, um, or any other type of music? In I general? think it has like because the game is like so fast paced and high octane. Like you know, it's three minute rounds for the regular battle. So like it's like you have a two minute song, and then there's like a one minute warning song that plays like while you're in the final minute of the round. It it almost has a crazy taxi vibe. Like, oh, with, so Offspring. <laughs> without, like, the Offspring, like, without, like, the licensed music. Oh, it has, okay. like, that feel to it where, like, you're playing it and, like, it, it fits it so well. But then there are some levels, like, in single player that just have, like, you know, a five-second loop and it just mm. plays it over and over again. But, like, some of the compositions are actually pretty entertaining. And it's like, oh, I wish I could have heard more of that instead of just on this one level. Is it just really fast, catchy melodies, basically? Some of it is. Um, other ones are, you know, like when you're at the menu select, I, I would say most of the, the gameplay ones would fit in that category. Okay. Um, but when, like, you're waiting for to be matched up against people in the, the lobby, it's it's kind of like this slow, like, ska, like almost like a, a no doubt <laughs> instrumental. <laughs> okay. All right. Hang on. Go, let's clear the floor and let Jeff Cork ask his top five questions about Splatoon soundtrack. Uh, yeah, I could, God, I don't even know. Top five? Yeah, I had yeah to, let's try and keep it short. Man. <laughs> no, uh, no. Is that death metal song? Is that super great? Because <laughs> I've heard that a couple times and I liked yes, it. Yes, it's it's just the best. Did you decipher the lyrics? No, I mean, have you ever been able to in a death metal song? I think Tim should be offended by that. I don't listen to death metal for the, I don't understand most death metal lyrics. Okay. They're just another I instrument. I have a question. Yeah. Is it about the soundtrack? Because... Uh, hold on, I have more. <laughs> hold on. Shuffling paper sound effect. Uh, what is the core match type for this game? Because I feel like I've had it explained to me a few times, and the core concept of the game just doesn't stick. I know that you're you're putting down ink, and you use that to go around faster, but is it also in covering the most amount of area before the you timer's up? So, so at launch, there are two modes. There's a regular battle, which is turf war, which is exactly that. Okay. You're, you're going around, you have a team of four, and you're trying to cover as much of the map right. as possible with your color ink, and then they can paint over you, and based on how much you cover, you get an individual score, which then transfers to leveling up. Got it. Um, ranked battle, which you unlock at level 10, um, I think... They keep saying that I, I can't figure out if when it when the game is actually launched if it unlocks for everyone worldwide. So I think that's what they've started saying now. Um, when enough people reach level ten, so like when eight people reach level ten, it's going to unlock worldwide. Or eight people, yeah, eight people. So that they worldwide. Can, <laughs> that's so what, so then it's presumably would they be the first people that would play it? Is it an eight-player mode? 
Yeah, it's 4v4 again. Okay. Um, but in this mode, it's called Splat Zones. Um, and there's actually going to be a rotation of different... Uh, I think that was a Nickelodeon show, actually. It sounds like one. Yeah. Um, and it, 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 you get kind of a Nickelodeon vibe, like because like, with all the, all the slime and everything going I'm everywhere. <laughs> um, but yeah, with the Splat Zones, which is the ranked mode that's, <laughs> that's launching right now, um, it is, it, it, it's pretty much the same thing, only there's just a tiny little rectangle in the map that both of you are trying to cover with and like it, whoever has control of that area based on like how much of their ink is on that spot okay. so it's it's kind of like a more focused version of that same game only it's five minutes long and if you like have your timer reach down to zero it ends prematurely and you get a knockout victory which gives you like a bonus for experience and you're shooting each other at the same time yeah right? so and if the... you shoot an enemy player and they get splattered which is the way of saying they were they were brutally murdered mm -hmm. um yeah it boom splattered Yep, it has that they, ring to it. <laughs> it explode. They explode in your color of ink, so it actually gives you an advantage for that as well. Ah, I kind of like that. So yeah. it's like their body is filled with your ink's color, and it just <laughs> explodes all over like a tick. It's like yeah. a fatality. Or is it like like a Goldfinger thing where they're just their skin can't breathe and they like no, they explode. Escape. They literally okay. explode. So it's oh, like that God. Kirby commercial where the guy eats too much and blows up. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that makes sense. Okay, more analogies, everybody. The so weird the, the oh, weird thing ahead. that they do with it though is because it it's kind of bare bones at this point in the multiplayer because there's only five maps and two modes for online multiplayer and they kind uh, of they restrict it by saying all right well when you turn on the game there's going to be a little news flash with these little squid guys and they say hey here are the two maps that you get to play for the next few hours in this mode and here's the two maps you get to sure. play in this. so it's like they restrict the five maps which is already a really lean list is this like them trying to save server capacity problems or and stuff? is it them or... just trying to shake it up every day so the game kind of has legs because you'll go back to see know. what different Be maps and that sounds like so... you would have an opposite effect are you because... guys trying to figure out what nintendo's doing here <laughs> <laughs> but but mistake here. you've seen many times in your uh, life but they are uh, saying that they're going to be introducing new maps uh new ranked battle modes um okay over, like between now and August, my brain feels so they're splattered. going for like long legs. Is it? Uh, it's is all it free. free. All it's the all content. The okay. Post launch content. They just want to keep people coming back to this thing, and that's what I wanted to ask you. Like, what sense of progression is there? Is it kind of? It strikes me as kind of a, a novel multiplayer game that I'm sure we're going to play a couple matches in, but it's not like for the next couple months I'm going to be consumed <laughs> by Splatoon multiplayer rounds, right? It's super accessible, and I, I found that the gameplay is pretty deep. Like, I, I played okay. like you know I, I probably put like. 15 hours into the multiplayer or so sure. um, and I'm not really sick of it at all like, I'm excited if I can like get a retail copy sometime soon here and right. keep playing even though my save's not going to transfer from, right. from the review copy um, okay. but yeah I mean it, from what I saw you can level up to level 20 each new level you get uh, unlocks a new weapon that you can buy um, and then once you get into ranked, there's another ranking altogether where you get 20 points if you win and 10 points if you lose. So it's not even based on individual performance at that point. Sure. Um, so that's another sense of progression. And then the levels in single player all have their own uh, uh, scrolls that you can find. Okay. So it's like each level has a hidden secret that you can try to go off the beaten path to try to find. Um, so there's, there's different things that incentivize you to kind of keep coming back for more. So when you're talking about matchmaking earlier and how you can't change your loadout without leaving that group mm -hmm. i heard this and i can't believe it's true like there is some way to get a match going just with your friends right and keep that rolling not with just your friends like what if, that's another functionality that's coming later so what, what you can do in this day and age it's i know a what, feature what you can do right now is you can go into your like there's another option after ranked and regular battles there's a friend battle and you can just go and it says hey this friend is currently in matchmaking and you can just join their party okay but like uh, so i guess theoretically you could you could all like if all the four of us were playing we could be like okay. hey i want to join ben's uh, party right now, and you just jump in, and then Jeff would have to do the same thing, and Tim would have to. We'd do have the same to time thing. it perfectly, Very tightly, though, because if someone else jumped in, presumably it would launch. But it'd be fair for your but friends. If like, you're, and if you're using uh, Nintendo's, you know, native voice chat, you can. <laughs> oh really wait a minute! Oh damn it! <laughs> you guys can all Skype on your phones. Did you? Were you annoyed by the lack of voice chat in this game? It didn't really bother me with Turf War because it's such sure. a quick game. Like you're, it's over in three minutes, so you don't really have time to strategize. And you you look down at the gamepad and it has the maps. So you can kind of see like, oh, well, I need to go over to this side. 
But with the uh, the ranked battles and splat zone, it, it was like a, it's a longer thing. And like if somebody starts camping right here in front of like the rectangular area, you're supposed to be coding. Like you can you, it'd prawn be nice, camping. They call it. It mm-hmm. would be nice to like warn like the rest of your team. Hey, there's a guy camping right here. Try and right. flank him or mm-hmm. go around another route. Like I had to kind of like you know take matters into my own hands and be like, oh, I noticed this guy's camping. I'm gonna try to flank him myself. And you then, can't like tap on the gamepad or anything and send a ping or anything like no, that on the map. The only thing you can really do with the gamepad is there's some weapons that utilize that. Like you can call in an airstrike and you just like tap where you want it to go. There's also a um, a way that when you first respawn, you can tap anywhere where a teammate is, and uh-huh. they'll you can instantly like fly to where they are. They've got some kind of like, hey, or great job. Yeah, or, like, like there's that like kind of... you can push up on the D pad and it says booyah. Nice or, work. So it's really great for coordinating. Two yeah. booyahs means on, on my six. <laughs> Something you really need to set up. Ba- basically, two booyahs if they come by night. It's like it's like the Navy booyah, SEAL booyah, signals. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I wasn't like. I was one of, I'm generally one of those people that is like, ah, voice chat's a little overrated. But like when you, it's not as crucial for every game as everyone says it is when they hear mm-hmm. that it's not a part of the game. But mm-hmm. when I hear about like, oh, you can't really coordinate with your friends that easy, and then everyone's got to back out, and then one person goes in and then time it so that their friends can see they're online, and then they join him at the same time. That's where it just sounds like, boy, coordinating a way to play with your friends sounds like a headache. You should probably go into this game not planning on playing with your friends, but you or can just. Kind of I would it. just Skype. I mean, that's gonna be my yeah. route. Is it, can you also can you play uh, four on four like against your friends, or is it only friends on your team? I th- I think that I, in my experience, I only got to play it like with friends on my team. Sure. So like, if the four of us joined up, um, right. chances are we'd be on the same team. But I think that it also does a little bit of balancing. So I, I'm not sure exactly how that works. And Brian, can fight. you be my friend? No. Okay. No. Will you find me friends for this game? <sighs> It's easier said than done. Okay, <laughs> I have a, I have a couple other questions. Is this a normal like full priced? Uh, it is. Yeah, it's it is. Uh, okay. fifty nine ninety nine. I believe the okay. sheet told me. Gotcha. I think on every price tag though it says, but keep in mind we're rolling stuff out till August. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Don't overlook this hit. Do you see it as like a, a franchise moving ahead for Nintendo? Would you want them to keep iterating on this idea? I mean, it's it's the core gameplay. I think they kind of nailed it. Um, so if they did want to do something with the franchise going forward, I think they could like hit it out of the park. Sure. Odds of other Nintendo character DLC coming and you have oh you know boy. you have Mario running around with the flood and it's team Mario and they're <laughs> laying out a bunch of stuff everyone's got flood uh, like uh, they just they saw <laughs> just flood <laughs> they saw the response to like the Mario Kart DLC where everyone's like oh yeah this is all we want cuz they talked earlier in this game's development how it was originally going to star Mario and they're like ah eh, this will actually work with new IP let's actually mm-hmm. go for it this time which I'm glad they did and so I would personally be a little bit bummed out to see him kind of backpedal and be like all right we'll get you your link with a squeegee or whatever the hell. Or you get some <laughs> weird reverse one where, yeah, like the flood would be like responsible for cleaning up everybody and you try to clean up everybody and yours would be like, all right, you know. If I they mean, add like new modes and stuff, that'd be cool. Uh, yeah, I actually thought that would be a kind of a cool mode, but then I was like, that's pretty much the exact same thing as Turf War Is where you're, really? you're kind of painting your thing only. Yeah, instead of, I guess you're painting it over. Yeah. yeah, you would just be painting over clean mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. Nice. So yeah. good time with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, couple, it's, a, it's a good game. Quirks. A couple things I, I didn't quite like, but uh, yeah. overall, it's a pretty good package. Well, Just nice. I wish there was more to it. Sure. What'd you give the game? Uh, it's not published yet. Oh. So we'll have to wait and see. Uh, yeah, it's a when, tricky one. Do you use the word uh, splatforming at all? I did In not. your review? No. Okay, it's not too late. <laughs> splatforming. <laughs> Coin it. Yeah. Hey, Jeff Cork. Ha! Huh. You are our resident match three expert. Okay. And you were assigned the task of checking out this Puzzle and Dragons Super Mario Edition. Yes. I want to hear you say the name of the game again. It was so it's, good. It's Puzzle and Dragon Z plus Super Mario Brothers Edition. You got it. Baby. Yeah. And so the Puzzle and Dragons aspect yes. is brand new for 3DS. They basically took the free-to-play Japanese mm-hmm. Match 3 sensation mm-hmm. uh, and brought it over here and sold it everywhere with this. Well, like, it's been brought over here. That's true. It's been over here for it's a on while. iOS. iOS yeah, yeah, that's true. I tried it for a little Android while, but... Stuff. I think back when I tried it, I didn't really understand how it was played. It's like I kind of wanted to get a sense of what was taking over Japan so but, much, and I completely yeah. blew it in the beginning, and then I picked up this game, and I was also blowing it for a little while until Tim realized that he looked over my shoulder and said, this is how actually well, you play this game. You were doing the thing that I was doing. And, and <laughs> what I'll, were you doing? I'll let, oh, well, what I want to say, the thing that I think makes this easier to get into than you know previous editions is there's no weird like oh is this am i not getting this part and it's harder because i'm not paying money right and this just eliminates that from the Mm -hmm. equation it's like okay it's all here i should be able to have fun with this thing right and the thing uh that ben was having trouble with is i was also kind of off to a shaky start when i started playing it like first i was playing it like i'd had a couple drinks and i went back to it and we've all been there and then i was like okay hold on a second hold the phone 
What? Puzzle and Dragon Z Super Mario Bros. Plus Edition. Su- plus, plus, plus Super, Super Mario, Mario Bros. Come on, cut. <laughs> and let's shoot, let's start, let's do this part again. Uh, basically, um, I, I, I got a handle for it when I realized how important getting combos is and plotting. Plotting was yep. the thing that I had to really... Right. You have to slow down and... and describing puzzle games is tough, but what you need to do is you have to decide, okay, this one gem, I'm going to start moving around, and every time it moves past something horizontally or vertically, it it's displaces that mm-hmm. by sure. one to wherever it was coming from. Yep. So basically, oh, I see that, you know, there's a there's two in a row, there's two leaves over there in a row, and I want to do wood damage, uh, and if I can make one move over there, that will bring another leaf in in a row with it. And then I can see this path leading to the stars that need one more in a row. And then there's another one. I'll try to land over there and put it there. And then the piece that I moved was actually a fire flower or something. And that'll complete another three. Then those clear drops. You hopefully get Hang a- on. How many are in the star line to the right on the far right of the screen right now? <laughs> try to keep up, Ben. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, you clear those, they drop, you hopefully get a domino effect. Yeah. yeah. And I was watching, looking over Ben's shoulder and he was just like, Doing like one little move at a time while like, sucking Poof. my thumb, <laughs> <laughs> like oh me no like, uh, and uh, so I I made it I burped him yep. and then uh, I told him how to play uh, Puzzle D like a man. Well, that's then... that's the thing is that you go into Puzzle D and you expect <laughs> it to play like Bejeweled because it looks like Bejeweled, and so I played a lot of Bejeweled. And those reflexes are kicking in, right? And then it's that kind of painful experience of learning new things. Where it's like okay, mm. a new the timer. The timer and just trying to understand the new dynamics for this match three game, basically a puzzle game. It's like it's kind of like when you start playing, which I guess I did recently, like Mean Bean Machine, mm-hmm. uh, or Great like game. Great nice. game. That's right. Or uh, what is the the combo game with Tetris? They have what Puyo Puyo Panic. Right. Um, same thing. Um, but just realizing that okay, these this board that looks familiar, I need to completely reframe how I look at this thing and right. try and see new patterns and possibilities within that. And it's kind of a rough learning curve, but. Once you get through it, I really, really like this game. The, the mm. other thing we didn't say that makes it, like, I, I blurted it out there, but is the timer. That you have, like, sure. you could move this little piece really fast and do a lot of crazy things with it as long mm-hmm. as you plot it out. You could, like, move a piece to the other side of the board if you have, like, a quick spin. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. But the timer, you know, kind of keeps you, keeps you restrained. Uh, but you get better at both plotting out paths and also your actual dexterity, I think. Yeah, yeah definitely. Chef Cork? Uh, yes. So you had played Puzzle and Dragons before? Yeah. Going well, into this. So you knew bunch. like the dynamics of what you should be gunning for. You see you could you could see the patterns. You could see inside the matrix of this thing already. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So what did the Super Mario angle add for you? Well, Ben, you got a world map. You've got a peppy, <laughs> familiar soundtrack. I don't realize I was talking bah, to Scott Arkerman, but all right. Bah, bah. <laughs> yeah, it's that kind of like new Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> it should be beginning. called. Puzzle and Dragon Z plus new Super Mario Bros. editions. Yeah, that's true. It is all themed after that with the music and whatnot. Don't yeah. expect too much retro Mario love in there, but... No, uh, I was trying to think. Because there's two different games in there, and right. the differences between the two games are quite subtle, but yes. when you play them, you're like, oh, okay, this is a fairly significant difference. Um, I think the... Biggest differences from the uh, previous Puzzle and Dragons are more noticeable in the, the Puzzle and Dragons Z. Which I started that. Um, oh my it, God, there's a lot of talking in that. There's so much talking. Like imagine playing Bejeweled Blitz, mm-hmm. but then just having the most boring Pokemon style dialogue strung out in between every round. Just, like, just let me get back to that it's, thing. I'm just getting into the groove and now you're slowing me down mm-hmm. with this garbage. Like trying to write on MS Word with Clippy still enabled or whatever his name <laughs> exactly is. Exactly like yeah. that. Yeah, so does that... Did you? I, I mean, does it get better? Does the storyline go anywhere interesting with that? Because they pitch it as like an RPG, but it's really just like right. a hub town that you then go on missions from. Exactly, yeah. And uh, I mean, it is what it is. The story is... <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's one of those I wish that... You could kind of go, eh, you know what, I'm really not into this. Right. Or I uh, graduated from junior high, so I can read pretty quickly. Let me just skip the text right. even faster than you think I need to. Yeah. But it, uh, it's, I, it's, I like it Okay. a lot. <laughs> but yeah, the story is super dumb. But the actual mechanics behind there, it's got this weird kind of puzzle piece theme where like right. oh my god chunks of the earth are being or whatever fantastic planet we happen to be on well are, dogma the demon has torn oh the puzzle pieces out gosh, of the earth and his oh, goons no, he's back yeah. yeah he's back big <laughs> time right. baby thought we vanquished and uh yeah these puzzle piece shaped things i think they were like we you know like we're finally getting called on it 
there there's really nothing uh puzzle oriented about this game so maybe puzzle pieces <laughs> right uh, and there are dragons there are dragons exactly but um the biggest thing you know like those things pop out and you kind of have to rebuild the world whatever but uh one of the ways that is kind of manifested also is the way that you evolve your dragons mm-hmm. or your monsters in that one you get like these little chips that are shaped like puzzle pieces mm. and when you acquire enough of them you can evolve your character by like doing a little puzzle mini game. So instead right. of like leveling up the characters like you can in the Mario edition, they're actually like Pokemon evolving. No, you do evolve, um, level them up as well. Okay. Like, you feed like, lower. Isn't, do you want to explain sort of like the, the evolving process a little? Yeah, there's a couple of ways you do that. Like the, um, with like the puzzle and dragon Z thing, you have the puzzle pieces that you yeah, incorporate and then it brings them to like the next stage. So like a little, little fat roly poly guy, Suddenly, he looks a little leaner. And yeah, he's still the same color. Has the same like oh. dopey moose face or whatever. Okay, I'm thinking of one in particular. But, <laughs> but uh, you've got that, and then they level up as you kind of uh, defeat enemies when they're part of your party. And then also, um, you can through one of the machines you kind of interact with your guys with machines. You can kind of feed them um, eggs that have not been hatched, and that'll increase their their. Uh, like they're leveling faster okay, so you don't sure. have, like if you've got a new guy and he's like low level you don't have to sit there and, and grind as much with that right hmm. and hmm. it's similar in the mario brothers one but to evolve you need uh like basically crafting materials you know what i mean you, you right like, p wings p wings etc mm-hmm. yeah, with, like, with that story added into the z version of this game mm-hmm. it's interesting to think that like well if you want the pretty traditional puzzle and dragons experience play the Super Mario Brothers version. You know, you're not going to have all that dialogue fluff in there because like, it really is just a stripped down, simple match three with some pretty enticing progression. There is there. some like, you know, like Bowser Jr. is in the game, so I don't spoil it. You can right. edit this out. But I mean, like, Whoa. he'll like, he'll say, hey, I'm going to get you. You know, that's, and that's all the you story, want. That's all you need. Yeah. Like, just let me match stuff. And the strategy involved with matching is deeper than you'd expected. Mm-hmm. And then at the same time, it's also flashier. And just as satisfying on a dopamine level when the entire screen lights up because you made that oh. one smart move. You get the double effect where it's like, oh man, I got like 11 combos there. Boom. And then you see like all your little guys, like your five guard, five or six guys in your party, just like this torrent of just blinding light. Just <laughs> bam, <laughs> boosh, too, right. too high of numbers than any game needs to have. Like mm-hmm. everyone starts attacking like in the hundreds and thousands. Sure. Uh, <laughs> and then it attacks and, and you don't really understand what's happening early on. But... Uh, yeah, it was a uh, it was pretty fun to get the hang of it, and then you'll hit a wall somewhere, and then you feel like you're supposed to go back and maybe like level up characters, and then it's tougher grind, than I thought or? it was. Gonna I'm be. of the mindset, and like what I used to do on the iOS version, uh, I'd hit that wall, and then I'd go back and kind of start over, like slog through uh-huh. it again. I when I hit the wall on this one, I would just be like, I'm just gonna keep butting up against this spot until I pass, because you have unlimited continues essentially, mm-hmm. and everything that you on a unlock or whatever during those failed runs you still right. keep sure so you're, you're constantly making progression you're earning coins right. that you can use in toad's house for his little uh random right hit a block thing what's interesting about this game is to think that gung-ho like the developer and publisher of puzzle and dragons mm-hmm. that when they were making the 3ds version they went all out and made this very pokemon inspired rpg and then at the same time Nintendo is looking at the cash that Puzzle and Dragons is raking in, mm-hmm. and they released the free-to-play pu- like Pokemon Shuffle, which is their attempt at a Puzzle and Dragons well, style game. But they for had 3DS. They had Pokemon Battle Trezai as well. Yeah. Um, oh, that's which is right. Pretty much the same thing. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. It's just weird that they kind of like two ships passing in the night. They're each like, "Hey, that looks really good over there. Let me try what you guys are doing." That, that was actually my next question was, or my first question in this segment is, mm-hmm. uh, how does it compare to Trezai? I, I, I Trezai is really fun, but. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it's as deep. Okay. Uh, over the long haul, uh, I think that Puzzle and Dragons is ultimately, in my opinion, a better game. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I really love. Because really fun too, though. But sure. I love it. I love the idea of the premium free-to-play port. You mm-hmm. know, as so many people when they're talking about free-to-play games, like if you could just give me the bench price and I can buy in there and then be satisfied and give me like just the base level challenge, mm-hmm. that's all I want. And this is really satisfying on that level. And I wish more games would do this. Like. I went back and tried to play Jetpack Joyride, which is like one of my favorite iOS games of all time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's just, there's so many items, there's so much nonsense that I know that I can just buy my way 
mm-hmm. to constantly get so many head starts and revives and it just becomes such a mess. I just want that stripped down pure experience again. It was weird because I like after I wrote and published my review, I kind yeah. of went and uh, I was like, I wonder what other people thought of it, you know, and a, sure. a lot of the reviews that I read, people were complaining about the lack of free to play barriers. Really? There were, there, it was like they said that it didn't make it interesting and I kind of got the impression that they're like, this is a terrible analogy. I don't mean for it to sound insulting, but like if you just pour a bag of dog food out in the middle of your living room, like it made it seem like some of these players were just like, I will eat until I just barf my brains out and then I will continue to eat more. Like I can't, I need someone to artificially to tell me when to stop. When, <laughs> what? <laughs> like it was oh, like- Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm following. Yeah, like those free to play barriers were kind okay. of like a built in, Okay, I guess I'm done. This is when you should turn your phone off because your energy should come back and you should come back later. But so, the, but without these artificial yeah, barriers, basically the they fact just keep that you, playing. you could just keep playing and that's, that wasn't good enough. So well, it's Halloween the, candy night where you just keep... Exactly. Okay. And I, I, can, I guess I can understand that in like that barrier is nice because it does require you to kind of go, okay, well, I, I think I am done. But Yeah, and you also don't go into those games, like free-to-play games, where like, I'm going to beat this thing. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, Mario... Puzzle and D, you like you have that end goal in mind where it's like yeah. level eight four or whatever it is. Like I'm just gonna gun straight for that thing, and yeah. it was kind of a grind for you to get there. Oh, I, I played a ton of that game. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you think that maybe the the fact that Puzzle and Dragons was a no free Brian, to play please, game. Right. it's Puzzle and D. Puzzle and D. Do you yeah. think that Puzzle and D being a free to play game kind of conditioned people who are fans of the series to always like want to keep playing beyond that barrier? And then now that they and can, now that they can, it's just like oh my god, I can't stop. That, that's certainly possible, yeah. Yeah. I just thought it was an interesting criticism. No, sure. I was like, yeah. Oh, I never really thought about that that way. I was just like, my eyes are sore, mm-hmm. and I'm, mm-hmm. I'm at a point where I'm not getting anything out of this. I'm just going to take a break. Sure. It's just like, it, it reminds me of someone complaining about when, you know, games moved away from lives. Like, God, well, I mean, if I don't get a game over, then I don't know when to stop playing this game mm-hmm. I like. So and that's why there's so many I, skeletons in front of TVs nowadays. I know. I can't. God. And I just want to sit there. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's just that's a really interesting perspective yeah, on yeah. that because I found it perfect for. All right. Well, you know, I got enough time to like play one area, you know, mm-hmm. which is usually like four or five enemies mm-hmm. with the boss in there. And it takes maybe 15 minutes, uh, uh, maybe 10. I don't know. And then but if you want to get through a whole world, mm-hmm. you know, uh, it takes it's a little bit more of an investment, you know, like forty five minutes yeah. hour. Yeah. We're like about three DS two. I'm done. Close that some close that yeah. lid. So uh Tim and I just got back mm-hmm. from Mexico. Oh boy. So I feel like we haven't had much time recently mm-hmm. to play current games except for Puzzle and D on the flight. Puzzle and D. Yeah. Puzzle and D. Yeah, so much of that. Yeah. Uh, but last night I did play episode three of Life is Strange, mm-hmm. which is an I'm adventure series that. that no one's really talking about. Yeah, how much did you play, Cork? I played the first episode. Okay. Until there was a fire drill, and I had to get out of the school. Okay. But I did. Did you lose interest, or what happened? I don't know what happened because <laughs> I, I absolutely want to continue playing about the season pass. Like, sure. Although, like, I backed out of the game probably about like fifteen minutes. I'm I, I'm in. Uh huh. I want to see this all the way through. So. It's it's a fascinating game, and I, I recommend you keep going with it. I know we both. We've talked on this podcast a lot about it, even on the last time we talked about Life is Strange, where we both have that sick obsession with Beyond Two Souls. Yes. And there are shades of that in here where it's just, it's relatively easy going to make progress in this game. And they nail so many unique things where it's like, oh, I've never really seen a relationship between like two women in the game like this before. Mm-hmm. Or like, I love the high school environment and the fact that it's a relatively mature game. Like they're swearing all the time. Sometimes they kind of sound like us young kids sound. Oh, yeah. And I love games that make pop culture references mm-hmm. casually this is a little bit you know ham-fisted at times but like mm-hmm. you know the main character can travel through time and like her friend finds out uh and then he's like okay i'm gonna give you a time travel primer this is all you need to know and he like writes out this big list like you gotta watch primer it's like i love the idea that like this game can reference primer which is a pretty mm-hmm. obscure <laughs> movie about time travel which you know nerdo kyle is always raving about wait it's, it's a primer that points to primer is primer also about a it's time a primer, primer primer that's right Wait, yeah, Primer is the name of a time travel movie. That's all about giving people primers for traveling through No, it it's just happens primers. to be called Primer. Oh, okay. So you, that was just unintentionally confusing. Yes, okay. that's correct. <laughs> gotcha. That's right. Okay. That's like a bag of dog All right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but those are the things that I like about this game. But then the rest of it just gets so bogged down in just really bad dialogue with adults trying to sound like kids. And like, it really feels like the language was put through like an English to teenager 
Google Translate <laughs> thing. Like it is bizarre. Yolo. It's a lot of that. AFK. It's a lot of that them saying it in real life. Like they can't just say a normal sentence. Like everything has to be doctored up and kind of funkified a little bit. Are you being serial right now? It's genuinely that. You oh, didn't hear serial. I would if I were a gambling man, I don't remember serial specifically, I could totally see it being in this game. Mm. I have a I have a list of some quotes. Dees? Dees? Uh, yep, I can see it being in there. All okay. right, so this is these are all quotes from Life is Strange. <clears throat> Episodes one through three. Da, 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 da. I'm eager to rap about that bizarro action yesterday. <laughs> Instead of just, hey, what happened? We should talk about that crazy sci-fi thing that happened yesterday yeah, in our hometown. I, I said that just eager? upstairs today. I know, but look, I you're a hip guy. Eager to rap. <laughs> Um, there's a guy named Warren who's trying to convince Max to go to uh, see the Planet of the Apes movies. Mm -hmm. And he says, I just love those old school ape films. I'm still all in to go ape with you at the drive-in. <laughs> <laughs> and then <laughs> my favorite is there's this character who is a security guard. Yeah. And he just looks like Adam Carolla. Um, so I'm, you know, predisposed to like him. Yes, he does. Yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> but his whole character, which should be a really interesting character that I've never seen in a game before, is he's a returning Iraq War veteran mm -hmm. who has some PTSD issues. Okay. Hmm. It's like, okay, I would like to see how this is handled in a mm -hmm. game. And the way they handle it is he just constantly refers to everybody as if he's in the military. Oh, so, so he's like a deadly premonition character or yes. something? Yes. Like, soldier, you don't have the facts. You need to get back in rank and file there. I should it's, have just said Twin uh, Peaks. It's yeah. a lot of that. Okay. It's a lot of that stuff. Uh, and then uh, from episode two, uh, a kid says, I'm getting my coffee on before I cut class and destroy some rails. Oh, he's going skateboarding. He's just going to go oh. skateboarding. He's going to drink I thought coffee. He was rail liquor. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> he's a saboteur. Yeah. Good. Yeah. But uh, so episode three, I still feel like it's interesting to keep going through. There's not really puzzles, even though it's an adventure game very much in the Telltale model. I think the animation is better than Telltale's. I mm -hmm. think the gameplay in general is better than Telltale's. Like there's little situations where, you know, Telltale will always jump out to like some quick time event. Like if, you know, you're trying to avoid somebody, it'll be like, oh, tap B quickly to hide behind this plant or whatever. And I really appreciate, like, in the episode three of Life is Strange, there's kind of like a stealth sequence where you're trying to, like, hide in the school at night and the security guard's walking through. And I was waiting for it to jump out to one of those sequences. But then it's like, oh, no, this is just straight up stealth sequence. Like, I just have to run and hide and this guy is actually going to walk through and try and find me. And it's like Telltale is kind of, like, refined and drilled in, like, the new model of adventure game for us. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to see something kind of shake those boundaries a little bit. The more I hear about the, this game, I think the more on board I am. Uh, you know, we... Um we're, we're going to be announcing like the new group of interns. Uh, oh, soon. sure. But I was, I was speaking with one of them and they kind of described it as sort of Lynch meets John Hughes, kind of like uh, David Lynch meets John Hughes kind of vibe. Hmm. Uh, yeah. And I'd heard sort of some of like the Beyond Two Soulsy kind of maybe Lynchy stuff in there, but sure. I hadn't heard the John Hughes stuff as much. Just I guess I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like, you know, kids in high school type vibe, but it seems mm -hmm. like I could get behind that. It's such a premise. great setting and there is it's weird to be in love with this game for the kind of quiet teenager moments but also captivated by the idea of it going all out crazy sci-fi because basically the stinger at every episode is like something big and crazy is happening in this town there's going to be some crazy catacly cataclysmic event that's probably tied into why you have superpowers and that sounds like Twin Peaks sure. to some extent. Oh, okay. You know? I can uh, see that. Yeah, you're going through all of Twin Peaks right now. Right. So you're and, kind of in the mood for anything in that vein. And there's other, I mean, that's sort of a David Lynch type thing is like, it starts out as a very powers. simple prem premise and there's some, yeah, superpowers. He's, he, <laughs> he, uh, Sat Superman Returns was actually David Lynch. Right. No, I'm just kidding. It basically, simple premise, weird stuff that starts to happen. But David Cage is also like that too. Sure. So. Yeah. But there's little moments like in episode three that I really, really love that make up for the writing and some of the clunky you know, find these six objects in this environment and just, you know, basically modern day pixel hunting. But there's a scene where like Max is back and hanging out. Max is back. Sam and Max. <laughs> and she's hanging out with her old friend, Chloe. And they haven't, they lived in opposite towns, opposite towns, different towns for like five years. Um, but she ended up crashing at her house. They wake up in the morning and then this Chloe character who's voiced by Ashley Birch, uh, she just starts playing a bright eyes song. And this entire Bright Eyes song, Lua, just plays as, like, the camera just shows mm. different beautiful things in the scenery of the, like, of the house and, like, out the window and mm. stuff like that. Interesting. So it's like Lost Cause in Beyond Two Souls. Exactly. <laughs> it's exactly like that. But then, What's like... Lost Cause? Uh, it's the Beck song. 
right? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, Jody okay. plays Lost Cause. Yeah, yeah. But oh, then, right. but then Max like walks downstairs and is like hanging out with Chloe's mom, and she's like, "Oh, this is just like the good old days when I used to sleep over." And look, you guys even have the same refrigerator. And they just have like a nice heart to heart over breakfast, talking about how much she used to crash her house. It's like I've never really seen this in a game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sure. And then the idea that, sorry, this is getting deep, but the idea that like Chloe then comes downstairs and she's clearly a, a kind of disturbed character. She's had like a rough upbringing, but she's your best friend in the game as well. And it was just a weird thing that I noticed where Chloe then talks to her mom and is kind of a little bit of a jerk to her mom. And it just was like another thing where I was like, I haven't really seen that in the game where I've bonded with a character and then see them relate to their parents and realize that you're kind of on their parents' side. Yeah. Like, oh, you're, you are kind of a flawed, uh, you know, stuck up little prick right now. You should really kind of tone it down a little mm-hmm. bit, Chloe. Your stepdad isn't that bad. Stuff like that. Well, but. maybe you don't see that side. Yeah. So there's yeah. two episodes left. Uh, it'd be fun. This would be a fun one to do a spoil on, actually. I know Kim is reviewing them, so maybe once that's done and over, we can get her in here for a second right. segment, really going all I'd in. Actually, Life is strange. I've been meaning to check it out. Also, sure. like I, I've kind of, I, I've kind of avoided it because I think I'm, I'm growing tired of like the, the telltale formula. Right. Um, and it, it seems like it's kind of along those lines. But the way it you're is. describing it is, it is kind of piquing my interest once again. Um, okay. I did buy the season pass, and I haven't even played episode. Oh, there we one go. Yet. I brace <laughs> for a lot of really annoying dialogue. If you uh, just brace yourself for that and just try and appreciate the setting, and try and see a slightly different take on kind of telltale's new formula <laughs> it's it's worth checking out for sure hmm. who but it's by who who developed it? don't not it's the okay um remember oh, yeah. me so, people so remember, remember me. me yeah it's a weird don't weird, weird touch yeah don't forget the name of that game exactly yeah. uh and then i also quickly played sword and soldiers 2 on the wii u right before we left um which is just a console rts which is the sequel is exclusive to the wii u now um but if you're into simplified console rts's it's some good simple fun that's the 2d one right yeah yeah it's 2d and it's kind of like it's an rts but you don't directly control any units Mm -hmm. uh and so it's kind of just like this tug of war style thing we can control the route that they progress on Mm -hmm. um but yeah it's a good time i'm a fan of rts's and console rts's um and so i played a couple games of that and it seems pretty charming but what you guys have been playing witcher 3 right yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you What do you think about that? I like that game. Do you? Yeah, I like cool. it a lot. Okay. What What's What's the big hook here? That it is not The Witcher Two. <laughs> okay. I've, tried, I've tried like, I think I've played the first three hours of The Witcher Two like th- four times probably. Sure. And just like oh, I really want to get into this, and the tutorial. I mean, I, I feel bad for like slamming a game for its tutorial, but sure, it just introduces you to like oh. This is a game where you have to put a bunch of crap on your sword before every fight, and you have to lay down a bunch of stupid traps. And it the pacing I think is really slow and uh-huh. ponderous. And it's too pacified for the tutorial. Him. Just I think that it, it sets it up, and then like the actual game is just He's I, like, it just never. I like hooked the me. tutorial. He's talking about Witcher Two, Tim. Oh, okay. You're just describing <laughs> things that you also do in Witcher Three in the tutorial, so that's why it confused me. Okay. Oh no, but in Witcher Three, it's not nearly as ponderous. mandatory. I mean, you okay. have all that stuff you can do it if you want, okay. but it's not like. Oh, I, I died because I had I didn't apply my potions in time. Uh, this nonsense. So. Okay, gotcha. I Some would argue it's just babified, Cork, and that's what's going on here. Then babify it up because I'm a <laughs> big old baby. That's fun. <laughs> so, but yeah, how far are you guys each? Or Brian, are you playing it too? Uh, I have it on Xbox One, but uh-huh. uh, thanks to Andrew Reiner, I have not started it in Prudent because of the uh, save bug that he ran yeah, into. Yeah, he's run into a couple Oof. save bugs. I, right, I, where he's like just that. lost his entire progress. So I'm just like, I'm not going to... So you just scared like, off. I'm not going to waste my time until it's like patched. Sure. Speaking of babified, I'm playing on an Xbox One too, and you just save all the time. I have any problems. Okay. And then okay. I'll be the first to complain when I do have a problem. Maybe I'll jump into yeah, it. This guy is falling. But, but I mean, did he just lost all of his saves, or just? I, I think he lost a few hours one time, and then the other time, like I guess he had to start from scratch but or I, something. You can have multiple save slots. You got a whole mess. I think he like it oh. didn't even say like load game anymore. I think it just oh, said like sucks. new game. Yuck! But yeah. how far are you guys? Uh, I think I'm probably a little over 12 hours or oh, something wow, like wow. that. I've played I think. L- probably 20 some, and I'm in the Jeez. second. What level are I'm you? in the second area. Uh, I think I'm like level six or seven. Okay, man, yeah. you can do a lot before you get to those higher levels. Oh yeah, uh, but I like exploring, and it is like perfectly suited for that. I'm worried because you're a bit of like a completionist, and you like doing side quests and all that stuff. And this game could just stink the rest of your life away. I'm hoping. Okay. <laughs> I'm hoping that it does. This is the only video game I'll ever play. Okay. So far, Witcher 3 is everything that I've wanted Dragon Age Inquisition mm-hmm. to be, but it 
doesn't have the problems that I had with Dragon Age Inquisition. Um, like exploring the world feels a little more open and worthwhile. Uh, the, you don't have to worry about your one guy and like Dragon Age Inquisition sets it up so that you can control your entire party and be really tactical about that. But very few people I ever talked to ever really switched between Dragon Age Inquisition, like their characters and stuff like that. They're mostly just controlling their own character Mm -hmm. and kind of playing it like Dragon Age 2. Uh, and Witcher 3 kind of removes all that. Just focus on, on Geralt and do all that. And uh, I enjoy that. Um, the story to me seems 10 times better. And like Dragon Age 1 was celebrated. It had some like really good moral grays and stuff like that. But I think Witcher is kind of blowing it away in that that sense of the word. And sure. also it's not like, ha- I know we're talking about save bugs and stuff like that. Apparently there's some Gwent bug that can happen when you play this card game that's in universe. And sure. I haven't experienced that bug yet, but on a moment to moment level, Dragon Age Inquisition seemed like you would just be like clipping through tables or you'd have like AI zoning issues. And mm-hmm. there was just so many little, like also just down to the cut scenes, like, or the, like the character to character interactions and how they have different camera angles as opposed to that sort of like really static, awkward Bioware thing. I'm making this comparison because I haven't really played, you know, these are the two fan, like Western fantasy RPGs I've played sure. uh, recently. And I think there's a, a clear comparison in my mind. Um, but just like the sort of setting and the way that characters interact with each other and are animated in Witcher 3's cutscenes just is really impressive for me given the scope of that game. Uh, I'm, I am having some problems with like the movement and like momentum of the character. I need to get used to it a little bit. Have you adjusted the sensitivity of the camera? I need, I should do that. Move that's that to like 70, 70, 0. 70. 7, Okay. And it is. It's a huge difference. That that yeah. sounds like a good plan. I, I also it's just like the the acceleration of Geralt when he's walking and mm-hmm. going to a run. Um, I think like he's like got this weird like, you know, he goes like from zero to sixty really quickly, and it's That's like a Witcher thing. Yeah, is, <laughs> is, it, is the oh, issue okay. that they just tailored the movement for the open world? And then trying to navigate like small buildings with them, he's just flying into walls. It's a little bit like you know, Red Dead or something like that. It reminds sure. me of that. But, you know, the thing is you need to find the sweet spot because if you're in like a dark cavern trying to explore around, like you should probably just be kind of putting a feather touch on the analog stick and having him walk around. Mm-hmm. Sure. And I think most people just assume that you should just be running everywhere because that's how I've controlled, mm-hmm. you know, most th- third person games. Um, once I got used to that, it's a little bit better. The combat, it's it's fun when it works, but I'm having trouble. Like I love everything except I'm, I'm really in love with everything except for the movement and the combat itself. Cause like it's one of those things where you got to hit the attack button and then wait for it to click in for a minute. You know, like it doesn't feel like it's right there when you hit mm-hmm. it. It doesn't feel like a totally responsive, a monster huntery thing, mm, but this is different. Like the, the pacing feels different that I understand that you're hunting monsters in both games, <laughs> sure. but there's no sort of lock on system where you're feeling like magnetically drawn to anything in monster hunter. Sure. So the when, animal magnetism, exactly animal magnetism. So I, I just think I, I, there's going to take some time for me to settle into the rhythm of combat. And I try to disengage and run away and just get killed and stuff. And, and then, you know, one level five pack of level five wolves I can handle, but then one level six, floater or whatever they're called could just <laughs> demolish me wraith things the yeah. noon wraiths uh no those the floaters i think are the uh the weird merman things oh like the dwemer is it there there's two kinds I okay think. there's a few different kinds anyway uh but i do love how they set up the character mm-hmm. like the monsters and you have to like study them and stuff and read the bestiary and figure out what their weaknesses are and like i'm a huge nerd for all that stuff so. yeah <laughs> yeah cool yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to, to checking it out. Yeah. Uh, now that I have some free time. You'll understand the movement thing. With I'm really, I've heard so much seconds. about this Witcher 3 movement. I'm excited to just touch the analog stick and then have Geralt just fly into the sky or something. Mm-hmm. You wish. He's like movement. a rocket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You wish you could His aim legs are just dangling. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Cool. Was that pretty good for our first segment, you guys? I think it was great. Wonderful. I liked it when we talked about Puzz and D. Great. All right. Well, let's move on to a Super Omega reader email section. Mm -hmm. Hello, and welcome back to the Game Informer Show podcast. For this second segment, we are going to be doing the super reader email grab bag just extravaganza. Right. Mm. We're going to be doing more reader questions this this week. Uh, we have to do the bonanza because of the spectacular. That's right. Yeah. And it's to make up for, again, like Ben said last week, where we 
focused on N64 questions. We missed some good ones mm. that were just kind of general questions. So is this a bonanza or an extravaganza? It's a bonanza-anza. Okay. Scravaganza. Bonanza's bonanza-anza. Correct. Bonanza's bonanza-anza, scravaganza. In pajamas. Uh, so also to set it up, we usually have a, a reader e- or a listener email of the week mm-hmm. set up ahead of time. This week, we're going to see which one we like the best uh, after we're all done with these. Right. And then we're going to award that person with a email of the week and then get them a little special. Something. And then we're also going to finally award the correct word between listener, reader, and viewer. Right. It's, I think <laughs> it's a real grab yeah. bag right now. Anyway, uh, and, and you can send those emails to podcast at GameInformer.com and then that's where we see them all and maybe we'll we'll read yours on the uh, on the podcast. We'd like mm. that. So, all right. So kicking things off, uh, Zach uh, writes from Philadelphia. What video games development, finished or otherwise, would you most want to see chronicled in a book? Zach. P.S. You guys should do a Streets of Rage 2 replay as soon as possible. Um, And uh, the reason is because there's a certain someone in the special thanks that we and Super Replay fans absolutely asterisk need asterisk to see. It makes me think it's like... Akihiro Hino or somebody, like the mm. creative director for Overblood? Maybe. But maybe it's Peepo specifically from mm. Overblood? That'd be it, fantastic. I bet it's you. Oh, and to you, the player? Yep. Speaking of Overblood, that was my answer for this. Oh, really? Yeah, was, I want to know everything huh. about the development of Overblood. So this is mm-hmm. like a nitty-gritty, like you were just talking about uh, Masters of Doom, is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. that's a great book. And so that just chronicles the complete history of it developing the first Doom. Yeah, from like the word go for like most of those core developers all the way up to, I think, they're working on Rage okay. towards the end there. But Overblood, if we haven't explained it enough, is a crappy PlayStation 1 survival game that we did a super replay of, and it's just alarmingly bad. Sure. Um, and... It's just one of those one, things where you just want to know how did this get made. That's <laughs> that is the driving question there, and sure. and I'm sure it started with a good vision. But what happened? Was it budget? Was it mm-hmm. creative conflict? How did it end up in the state that it ended up in? Or maybe the creator even thinks that that was good. Uh, was it River Hill Soft? Was that That's the right. name of the developer? You know yeah. what I think about a lot is like, what if the afterlife was this is probably like documentarians and filmmakers think this way but what if it was like what you could travel are you calling yourself a documentarian and filmmaker I, oh i mean I, you I, are emmy award winning that's yeah. true uh but you could travel anywhere throughout time and just sit and watch the creation of certain types of media this is a slight change from this question More people but like which is there any form of media where you'd want to watch every meeting and every discussion related to that thing's creation no You'll do find your limit somewhere. I mean, like, like, like what are you talking Super about? Mario Brothers? It, like, I love Jurassic Park. It's my favorite movie. Mm-hmm. If I could go back in time and literally watch every conversation that was required for the creation of Jurassic Park, I think I might want to do you, that. Are you saying I get to go back in time and watch, like, Miyamoto stumble through the woods to be inspired yes. for The Legend of Zelda? Right. Like, I could track Legend of Zelda right. and possibly, like, Mario crossover all the right. way down to Miyamoto's childhood. Let's get unrealistic. And How deep would you go with those I things? I would go to, to, like, what his like a summary of what his parents were like that right. led them to live where they did and what they, like, what they did for fun, whether it was bug catching or whatever, and steered Miyamoto towards. I would totally watch that, like, total... Genesis. Because right now we've only seen his parents for like the legs in the doorway of Yoshi's Island. Oh, you're, I think you're, you're making a really deep cut reference. Sorry, uh, but is for, there legs in the doorway of Yoshi's Island? Are you at the end? Yeah, yeah. Oh, they, they do like the, a Muppet Babies thing. That's exactly okay. that. <laughs> but yeah. anyways, uh, as far as this book goes, I'm gonna go with South Park: The Stick of Truth. Oh, interesting. Um, I would wanted. Be interesting. I was. I'm hoping somebody does a big blowout investigative piece, and I know it's annoying. If you're listening to this, it's like, well, you're a game for it. Why don't you do it? You know, and it's like, well, that's a good idea. I would like to at some point, <laughs> but it's a lot of work. And just going on the cover story trip, I was fascinated by the production of that game um, and just trying to deal with, I will say, the geniuses of Matt and Trey. Uh, I think it could be very frustrating and just trying to get that chain of communication and just the turnaround that Matt and Trey are used to for a South Park episode, which mm-hmm. is just like six days, just crank it out mm-hmm. and trying to harness that and get it working towards the video game cycle rhythm of development, it just seemed like a nightmare. Yeah, meanwhile, the publisher expires. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I just think there are so many stressed out people all throughout that project, and a lot of it is just trying to get that communication flow between the studio that's ready to go, and they just need these two brilliant guys to lock down some ideas, and they just could not do it because they don't like to be locked into anything until the last second. But you can't get to a last second unless mm-hmm. you lock down something. 
Um, so that's my number one. I've I've got kind of three answers here. Okay, perfect. One. Uh, one is one is a bad one. One is a good one, and one is kind of a wild card one. Okay, but how okay. do all of them make you feel? Oh, right, and like, right, how right. many letters are each of them? What well, do you the think first the afterlife one, is <laughs> first one is Duke Nukem Forever. Okay. okay, I think that would be interesting just because you know, I mean, it's obvious. Yeah. It's, it's a tumultuous development mm-hmm. cycle. Yeah. Um, it lasted what 13, 14 years. Right. Sure. So I mean, it'd just be interesting to see like, hey, from the conceptualization all the way up to. Hey, we're finally kicking this thing out the door, and it's awful. Like, I want to see like kind of yeah. what what that whole thing was like. Sure. Yeah. Um, Mass Effect. I'd like to see the trilogy of of uh, like just kind of like how how plotted out everything was from the get go. And you wouldn't um, really get too much of the drama with that. Imagine like we all want some drama in these books until like the end. I would love to see how the team reacted to. Mm-hmm. The reaction towards Mass Effect Three, because the impression I had, just like visiting that studio and trying to talk to him about, it, is everyone took it very personally, and it yeah. was a really deep cut for that studio's legacy. And the third one, uh, kind of a, a weird choice, but Saints Row Four. What? Or maybe even Saints Row the Third, whichever one was going on the during. Shift in I tone? think Saints Row the Third. I think yeah. was, that was, was the, the huge one. shift in tone. That, yeah. well, not only was it a huge shift in tone, but it happened during uh, the THQ collapse. I think Saints Row Three came out under THQ's watch. Did it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah. one of them, it was one Saints of them was in 4. development. Was okay. Saints yeah. Row Four. So it was mm-hmm. in development during the THQ collapse and being acquired by Deep Silver. Sure. But that's kind of a game that you need to be having like a really fun time. I feel like in, in right. some regards, or have like some high morale in order to write those types of jokes. And oh, develop, interesting. Like, the, okay. Those types of mechanics. So just kind of like how the team like kept that morale and yeah. right. I remember just, it was like when the THQ was going down. Jason Rubin was the president then. I remember he had like a big message, like a blog that he wrote all about like uh, the Volition team is so amazing. Like whoever takes over THQ, you cannot shatter that team. Like preserve this gem for the love of the entire industry. And it seemed like these Deep Silver pretty much did that. Yeah. I mm-hmm. mean now they've kind of separated yeah, in their separate ways with the creative director leaving and whatnot, but. Yeah, they got that out. Yeah. So, I mean, those are my Saints three Row choices. Saints Row 4 is an interesting choice, Brian. Well, I mean, I, I gave my reasons. Yeah, I no, that's that that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Jeff Cork. We, I feel bad because we talked about it earlier, so now it's going to be like, oh, this again. Beyond Two Souls. I won. Ooh! I, I, we really should do a, like, let's play of it, just doing a super deep dive on it or something. We call them super replays around here, Cork. <laughs> well, I want it to be just you and me. Okay. <laughs> I would love to. I would love to just... The best is if we could just break down... I've always wanted to do this, and I hope to do it at some point in the future. Just do a video, super replay style, but not just play through it, but just make the longest, most deep possible discussion mm-hmm. of game design about like why this choice here, what is happening here, why do you think they went with this? And just go through the entire gra- entire game beat by beat, and then at the end, just get David Cage and have him address all those complaints or points. And, or we, and we, promise to set him free when we're done with him. Yeah. That's right. right. We yeah. talk about it all the time, but it is seriously one of the most fascinating games I think I've ever played. It is. Looked. It's so expensive. It is a. It is. It set back the industry. It is a blemish. That I, the, whoa, I don't narratively that is one of the most embarrassing games I've ever seen. I think that is a stretch for the video game industry. I think that that's really for the tone and like the off. prestige of like that. That developer, what they did with Heavy Rain, and like I don't know, given like the. The technology that's there and like how good that game looked based on like how seriously they appeared to take that stuff. Yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe you guys don't think it's embarrassing as I do. I, I didn't I find it that embarrassing. Oh, I just okay. think it's a fascinating, weird game. Have we already yeah. like talked about the screenplay a million times on this? No, I can't remember. Really. So that we have it in there in our vault. And it's one of the like this is kind of like the anchor for why I think this game is so fascinating. Is one day in our office we got this big box and it weighed a ton and we opened it up and it was like a like a brick of paper and on the cover was like making it seem like this is the screenplay for beyond two souls right and then it's all like bound together and it's, it is it, seriously it looks like a cube of paper and you flip through it and it's just totally blank paper uh-huh this and is... there was an accompanying note that was like this is representative of like how big our screenplay like is a foot and game. a half deep right yeah. And it was well, except for there's one page in size 72 font that said, You're doing it, Jody. <laughs> You're doing, You're doing, doing it, Jody. <laughs> exactly. We got to stretch it out, though. <laughs> this was nothing else. Yeah. And then they, they sent it out on Earth Day. Yeah. Also, which was just uh, a total uh, like twist of it, too. But oh boy. It just shows that like they had, there was so much hubris around it. Right. And it is just absolutely fascinating to see that game because it right. just, it has so many problems, but it's yeah. just. And also, that's one of those games that. After it came out, nobody talked about it. Uh, it was made clear that David Cage did not want to do interviews about it. Mm-hmm. I don't think they were embarrassed. I don't think they should be embarrassed about it. No. But just clearly, 
Nobody wanted to talk about it. Tim is wincing. I think, like I think you're being ever. a little easy on this game. Uh, it, look, it I don't so think it's weird. impressive. I just think it's bizarre. But, yeah. And for the video game landscape, I don't think it's an embarrassing narrative. All right. I understand that. But the certain certain gravity that they approach those topics, I don't know. Sure. That, that's fine. We can sure. agree to disagree. But uh, I also want to acknowledge that there's probably people like listening and watching that are screaming Half-Life 3 right now. I just oh, want to sure. acknowledge that. So yeah. uh, moving on here. Thank um, you. Thank you, Zach. <laughs> uh, Miguel from Fairfield, California writes... Um, which developer would you like to see take on a genre that is maybe out of their current wheelhouse? For example, mm. just off the top mm. of my head, I would love, I would kind of like to see Treyarch do a third-person horror game. That's Miguel. Wow. I think it was based on like the the zombie mode and stuff. Yeah. Like that. I think they oh, really pulled it off well. that's a good point. Mm. I was thinking. So I know hmm. that Fallout Three has a good deal of sci-fi inspiration in it, with like the 1950s vision of the future. But sure, sure. what if Bethesda went like, like really went for sci-fi in an open world experience you know like crazy different colored planet and stuff like that and, and wandering around and you had a ship and stuff like just but that's not outside of their wheelhouse i don't know oh you're, oh, you're talking about like genre as yeah well? that's kind of his question i think it's like genre wheelhouse that, it's yeah current current wheelhouse. Wheelhouse. i guess i feel like they're they're i'm thinking more of a thematic genre i guess sure sure <clears throat> you're not gonna like mine then what do you got well i i kind of latched onto the word current hmm. i want nintendo to do a console sports game again. Ooh. Because I love like Mario Tennis and Mario Golf. It hasn't been that long, has it? Mario Baseball, all those th- were really great. I mean, on the Wii, you had Strikers Charged. Uh, There's a Mario Tennis on Wii, right? I, yeah, I think there is. But it's been okay. a while because they, they came out with a greater degree of frequency. Sure. And in particular, I want a, a awesome Mario Golf. Well, just for okay. Wii. Yeah, yeah, 3DS one's okay. You can play Mario Hoops, the three on three. I said game. console. Oh, dang it. That one Square made, strangely enough. Mm-hmm. Ryan um, Jay. I want to see Rocksteady join up with Nintendo to make a Metroid game. What a weird idea. Brian Shea, everybody. Yeah, yeah. that's a good one. That's, <laughs> real, out of their, good. that's that, real good. That's real good. That's real good. Ice I like fist. It. And what else could you do? Like a wave fist. Uh, Thinking of all of that glue, glue ball, glue ball, mm. <laughs> da, 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 uh, glue balls. Da, da. Um, I had a similar one. <laughs> this is dorky. I got Rocksteady doing a fighting game. Ooh, uh, maybe Dragon Ball Z inspired. Well, I mean, they they did kind of revolutionize the uh, the counter. There we go. Fighting that was in like Arkham. Sure, mm. just give me some one on one fighting. I'll give you. Steady. I'll give you the answer you wanted. Shinji Mikami does an RTS. Perfect. A weird, weird ass horror themed RTS. He's good at making weird enemies. Yeah. Why RTS? Uh, just you get to showcase a lot of enemy types. Okay. That's and true. Uh, and you kind of you're such a Warcraft and, three nut that you kind of well, want like that take on just the epic story yeah. from Mikami. And, well, maybe. I, I more so I like it that you know, hey, use a shotgun to blow off a zombie's head. That's the weak weak point, and then use a magnum on a hunter and sure just. I like that part. You want a Resident Evil RTS. Is that what we're getting out of this? Uh, yeah, next question. Uh, uh, Tim from Indiana writes, uh, my question pertains to cover story trips. I realize this probably varies per trip, but typically how much of a game do you guys get to actually play while visiting a studio for a cover story? I remember hearing that you guys got to play the entirety of Metal Gear Solid Ground Zeroes. Uh, can you remember any specific trips where you got to play a whole lot or very little of a game? Thanks, guys. Tim from Indiana. Tim from Indiana. Uh, yeah, good question. It does obviously vary quite a bit from a tiny gameplay demo uh, to getting hours of hands-on. And a lot of it has to do with what's, what state of development is the game in and then we go to see it. Right, right. Uh, but, I mean, there's certainly been cases where it's been so early in the game's development. Like, I think, like, Lego Marvel Super Heroes Cork, mm-hmm. where it's like there wasn't really a concrete demo. It was just, like, a couple of running like rooms where they show like running around they talk about like, the overall story and stuff and you just kind of have to imagine like all right how is an actual full sequence going to play out right that's that's the most exciting time for me oh yeah it's just seeing like, the gray box areas and stuff yeah like that. it was fantastic to see it like that yeah or like i'm thinking of like witcher 3 like it was really fun because there was one mission one side quest that they had pretty fleshed out as like a vertical slice but then going into like the open world uh it was just a mess at that point and towns were like crudely constructed and a lot of areas were just gray box for like but then they could fly the camera around you could see like the entire world and so that's always a weird cherished memory now and i'll, I'll look forward to playing the game and then thinking back to like oh yeah i remember i saw that world when it was still in the oven quite a bit right um, mm-hmm. so even though it's not the prettiest that's that's always fun to see and sometimes you'll just 
if it's a sequel, you'll kind of take what you know of the previous games and they'll talk about new ideas within that context. You know, I'll, I'll take like my first cover story trip, for example, which was um, that I was part of was Dragon Age 2. And they showed us some really rough, you can actually, I think we still have on the website, rough mm-hmm. combat that I like re- used a camera. I did the video stuff for that trip, so that's how long ago it was. I was on that trip with you. That's right. Uh, and Joe Juba. And uh, mm-hmm. I just recorded off screen footage of combat. And that was, I mm-hmm. think, the only real uh stuff that we i don't know if we saw much else besides that that was a really thin yeah it it was it was but like they talked a lot about the world and what they were going to do and we've had cover story trips like you know bioshock infinite i wasn't on that one but i know that that wasn't playable Mm -hmm. um but you can you contrast that to like mad max was one of the last ones i you know that ben cork and i were all on and we got to play hours of that game you know, I know it's it's due out later this year, but still, right? Like, that was a that was really helpful. Uh, yeah, same with like Just Cause, also from Avalanche stuff like that. Uh, I was thinking like Mass Effect Three might be like the skimpiest, where it's oh. like, boy, we did not have much to go on. That was my pretty next, early. That was my question because I have not had a chance to go on a cover trip yet. Like, sure. what, what is the trip that you guys have gone on that has like the the least amount of of details and least amount of like I guess insight into the game? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, man. I don't know. It's. I think I've been pretty lucky on a lot of my mm-hmm. trips. Uh, we talked about Dragon Age Two, which there wasn't a lot there. Um, sure. So it. I remember that game sounded pretty cool based on what they were talking about. Um, well, when you're coming off Origins, yeah. But I think, I yeah. think Mass Effect Three is probably. I was trying to think of like any of those that were super early in the game's development. I guess Witcher Three was pretty early, but they just had a lot ready to go. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. I mean, they, they brought up Metal Gear Solid here oh, yeah. for Ground Zeroes. So, like, for Ground Zeroes, we've got a lot. I mean, I think they were out about a little over a month out from release, or maybe a couple months right. out from release for Ground Zeroes. And we were able to play through its entirety a couple times, uh, which was, that's fantastic. Yeah, um, and then it was also, like, the combo of, like, yeah, we can have hands-on for all of Ground Zeroes and then also ask questions about Phantom Pain. It's like, okay, right. it's an awesome one-two punch. So we had a, this. a three-part cover story. The, the other part was just kind of, like, uh, Kojima's life up to his life and career up to now and, and kind of how he felt about things. And then Ground Zeroes and then Phantom Pain, which was kind of like a lot of concept art, talk, a lot of talking and watching sort of Big Boss ride around on a horse through right. Afghanistan, which looked really cool, but we didn't see a lot of gameplay there. So right. like that section of the game was based heavily on some, you know, some concept art and, and interviews and stuff, which is not, un, that is not uncommon for a preview. Right. And then trying to ask like, hey, what's with that Eli character? Yeah, like I tried asking uh, the artist Shinkawa about like, can you talk about the design process for the Eli character? Just trying to get him to slip up in any way and hint that it's liquid because it's totally liquid. Um, and he was just like, I don't think I'm allowed to say a single word hmm. about Eli right now. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely a good question. So um, let's see here. Oh, this is kind of related to uh, a question there. After seeing Mad Max Fury Road this weekend, I got to thinking about how a game based on the movie would feel. I was quite excited and went back to the cover story Game Informer did in anticipation. Um, my question, questions is, are how do you get a licensed game right? Hmm. Second, do you have examples of when a licensed game has gotten it right? Uh, love the show. All you guys and Kim do a great do great work over there on the podcast and in the magazine. Uh, Eric uh, writing in uh, Across the River at the University of Minnesota. Uh, I think that we had a good example. Like, I'm really excited for Mad Max. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think you look at something like Batman 2, which is like, yeah. it's licensed, but it's doing its own thing entirely. And sure. that's why I have faith in Mad Max. It's not holding too close to uh, Fury Road. Yes. Right. And we, we published yeah. an article about like the kind of loose connections between mm-hmm. the game. It's different universes, but there seems to be George Miller's collective hive mind of what he sees the Mad Max universe as being that mm-hmm. Avalanche has been able to pick from. I think the biggest trap that people fall into is trying to go beat for beat and retelling a story. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. When they're totally different formats, and it's like what works for a movie, like those lulls mm-hmm. in action mm-hmm. and just exposition and stuff like that, and a game is super boring. Right. Yeah. And also, I mean, we just published a video uh, with John Blackburn, who's the general manager over at uh, Avalanche, not the same Avalanche as Mad Max, mm-hmm. but the team working at on Disney Infinity, which are different studios. A lot of people are still confused with that, understandably. Um, but he was just talking about also how tough it is working on licensed content that's directly tied to a movie because especially animated movies shift so much in development. And so mm-hmm. trying to go beat for beat, like 
you don't even have an option to get those down moments because you don't know that they exist. You just yeah. get bullet points of like, yeah, it's going to have this sequence on a train, then this and this and this. It's like, all right, I guess we got to go off this. I think that uh, the Arkham series is a really good example of like how you make a good game because it it it's has freedom and autonomy from like the Batman movies and like the, a lot of the story arcs. It's a, it's a fresh thing in itself. Um, but it also has a lot of respect for the property. Yeah. Like, I mm-hmm. mean, the, the guys who wrote the story for, like, Arkham City, they, they knew their stuff when they went it's in to write that. Like the, you know, like the, um, the, the God, what's, what's the name of the developer? But the Transformers games. It's, uh, High Moon. High Moon. I knew there's there was a moon such something. gigantic Transformers yeah, and that, that, yeah, and that translates into, uh, into the games really well. Um, and I think it's interesting. I think people probably think back to the glory days of licensed video games where it's like, oh, man, like... The Aladdin game was awesome. Those DuckTales mm-hmm. games were awesome. Darkwing Duck was pretty cool. I'm listing a lot of Disney games. <laughs> uh, but like that was an era where like narrative in games and the capacity to do narrative well was super thin. Sure. So you had to convey all that stuff through gameplay. Mm-hmm. And I think that's probably where the stumbling point in most, like, you know, from the 32-bit, 64-bit sure. generation on where that stumbling point happened. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think of like highs and lows within the same game just because I played this to capture footage for that John Black for John Blackburn uh, Disney Infinity video. Mm-hmm. But thinking about the Toy Story 3 adaptation where it was kind of separated into two modes where they had the story mode and then the toy box mode. Mm-hmm. Of course, you reviewed it. But toy box mode, you're just going around in this open-ish world and kind of building up this town uh, in the Wild West. And it's, just, it's fun. You go on little missions and like customize everything and just kind of play around. And that was great. And it kind of was very reminiscent of like the early playing around sequence that opens Toy Story 3. Mm -hmm. And then the other mode, you're going through the plot of the film, but it's filling in crucial gaps. Like, remember they got Andy's cell phone in the toy box and they tried calling it to get Andy's attention to come over so he would come play with him? Well, don't you want to know how they got that cell phone into that box? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there's an elaborate (laughs) sequence where they had to go hunt down just the right pieces in the right way to get that cell phone. And, like, that was what the game was telling. It's a great example of, like... Was it canon? I guess. (laughs) It was a great example of one game doing it both ways, and one way just feels so much more fun. Yeah. Yeah. And at that point, it's kind of like their hands are tired. Like, what do you do? Right. You know, you've you've got this many, you know, you have to fill this much time, presumably. You can't just go, well... Uh, you're gonna ride that dog around, like in a race for <laughs> I'm so listening. many laps. <laughs> yeah, one of the games that always has bothered me because I have I have to admit I have not played Legend of Korra, uh-huh. but the original Avatar: Last Airbender, there was that. It's it's seriously one of the best shows ever. I think, in my opinion, it is like wow. fantastic. And we just rewatched it at home not too long ago. And ever, ever, it, it is fantastic. Okay. Yeah, oh, wow. This is someone who like I I don't like cartoons usually, but it's great. Okay. Um, and the whole time, I'm sure at some point my wife was just like, "Shut up," because I was just like, "How have they not made just the best video game of all time based on this?" Because okay. it's got a really great story, and there are sequences you're like, "This would be fun as hell to play," and you wouldn't even have to like do a whole lot of crazy modifications to like squeeze stuff in. But instead, they had that one game that came out early in the 360s life. Right. Everybody farmed of, it for achievements, and that was about it. Yeah. So that's heartbreaking because you could see potential for something that could right. kind of stick close to an established storyline and, and do it pretty well. Especially with like, is it Cyber Connect that makes the Naruto games? Cyber Connect two, yeah, yeah, they, they really, Naruto really... and and Asura's Wrath. Right, right. But people mm-hmm. love. I, I've never seen Naruto myself, but people really love those games and they just knock it out of the park. So if that level of detail really went into like the Avatar universe, it's another example of a developer knowing their medium super well. It's very sure. obvious that those develop like Cyber Connect two knows anime so well, which right. is why Asura's Wrath as the entire framework. Of an anime, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, that's a, that was a good point. Um, okay, so uh, Josh from Modesto, Tel- Modesto, California writes. Also, uh, everyone did a great job of citing where they are writing. In You've from. really drilled that into these. I love it. Heads. Don't you love it? I it's do, but like, it's nice. I went through the e- inbox this week, and there's a lot of people writing in their lengthy question, but then with the follow up. By the way, so Tim doesn't get mad. I'm from Irvine, California. <laughs> yeah, you better be. <laughs> Don't be lying. I'll know. <laughs> Irvine from California. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, okay, so Josh writes from Modesto, California. All right, we get it. When, Modesto. <laughs> when playing Mario Golf on GameCube, my older brother rushed through the game, the menus and released, uh, I'm sorry, erased my memory card. Hang on, can we break that down a little bit? His brother rushed to the menus like, oh, i got to play this game right now. Right <laughs> the controller's just like fluttering it to the hands. data screen and Ugh. then hit delete? Uh, I don't know, probably a, a hyperactive uh, brother there. Oh. Um, 
Josh's story is really falling apart. Here. <laughs> erased, <laughs> erased the in- entire memory card is what I'm gathering. Wow. Yeah. So uh, I was on the last boss in Paper Mario, Thousand Year Door. Mm-hmm. Great game. Uh, I almost beat Wind Waker, and both games I borrowed from a friend, making it a bit harder to beat them. So I get. I think what he's saying is like I was borrowing these. I had a limited amount of time, and I lost my right. save, so I was screwed. Um, have any of you lost data from a game, or worse, an entire memory card? Sincerely, Josh. Um, Hmm. I actually, speaking of GameCube, I lost an entire memory card. I just straight up lost it. And I remember buying another memory card because I had all my, I worked so hard for my Resident Evil remaster, sure. Resident Evil 0 and Resident Evil 4, 100% all mercenaries, every weapon, cleared it with every character multiple times. I, I unlocked everything. I'm like, mm-hmm. you are not taking that away from me, world. Uh, and so I went and bought this thing that allowed you to plug it into the, contro- the computer and download saves off of like game facts. Okay. And so I got them replaced. I think I found the memory card later or something, but I just freaked out about it. Yeah. Uh, and then the other one is that um, I got like a weird corrupt save thing. I feel like I've said this story before on Enter the Matrix and uh, <laughs> was so into the Matrix at the time. So I wanted to see what happened with that story. You were fully entered, yeah. I was f- just entered the Matrix and within it. And... Uh, I was just like, I remember I kept on going down into like this crypt to fight werewolves or something. I think it was the spinoff part from when they go into that weird party and I right. think Matrix Reloaded. And I'm just like, God, I don't want to play this game from the beginning. I bought it this, I, this, on my original Xbox and I went, I returned the game. I'm like, bro, okay, bring back the game. Plug it in. That's not the problem. Okay. I'm going to go get a memory, new memory card. Go bring that in, transfer off the uh-huh. old one, put a new memory card in. Didn't work. Finally go to the internet. And then apparently it's a common corrupt save data thing. So I just had to start all the way over. And oh, I actually went to the extent of winning. Oh, I I took the slave off on a memory card and Mm -hmm. then traded in my Xbox for a new Xbox and then put the save back on it. Matrix game? Yes. For Enter the Matrix. Wow. I really didn't want to replay that stuff. (laughs) I thought the game uh, was that bad. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, At at a loss, I think. I think I traded it in for a new Xbox and then. Wow. Uh, it uh, didn't do it, and Rough. eventually I just downloaded a save. I think that was it. Mm. It got me just past that. I got a good triple whammy on that front. Uh, went on this vacation with uh, a friend of mine and his family, uh, and the vacation was rough because his parents were going through, about to go into a divorce situation, and so they were not on the best terms. Where were you going? Uh, we went to a resort up north, like on a lake. Up and north, so it was, northern Minnesota. Northern Minnesota, sorry, yeah. So I was just like sitting there politely like, watching this family going through a very, very <laughs> tough time. And I was like, okay. Jeez. Then went home, and the new kitty that we just had, uh, it turns out that it fell off a table in our screen porch and snapped its own neck on the cement floor. Why did... And so the what? entire week, I was looking forward to going home and be like, I'm going to play with the hell out of this kitty. I am so looking forward to playing around with this kitty. That's not a save file. That's yeah, an that's actual save animal. File. That's just the animal you want so to play then, with. So <laughs> then, I then went into my room to beat the last boss in Legend of Lagaya, which is a lengthy PS1 RPG. Went to my save file, Snap and my neck. character was named Vaughn, which is the main character's name, Final and Fantasy then a a a a a a and that was the character's, that was like the slot. I was like, wait, that's not my character. What is happening here? Turns out some neighbor kids came over while I was gone and wanted to play PlayStation. So they started a new game in Legend of Lagaya and just saved over my like 40 hours save. And they snapped your kitty's neck. And then oh, they snapped my kitty's neck. So how did they, geez. your parents let them in just to play with your stuff? Yeah, because like I was going to play video games. <laughs> like, yeah, go Screw ahead. That. While I was that out. Sucks. Your parents I mean, your suck. parents your parents are awesome. They may be They're, now. They are fantastic. That sound like garbage. Parents. And they are they nice. Yeah. They are nice for that reason. Right. But they would have never known that that is something that would be such a. They didn't understand how long Legend of Lagaya was for the PS One. And the the only that, thing that could have been the same is if they went into their VHS collection, VHS collection, and just started pulling the ribbons <laughs> of tape out of or it, recording right. over the favorite movie. Yeah, yes, for like exactly. Joseph Campbell Power of Myth VHSs. Yes. Uh, and this might make me monster. I got teary-eyed when I saw that save being The other stuff you could handle. That's right. Divorce. Yes. Kitty death. (laughs) But you got Legend of Laguia, and you're just like, it was probably like the straw on the camel's back thing. Yeah, I just broke it down. What is the example of that? Like, there's a great example from a a movie where just someone just beats the crap out of, oh, oh, my gosh. He kicks the can every time he, oh, I'm sorry, it's Better Call Saul. Every day, in Better Call Saul, (laughs) it's not a classic movie. (laughs) Modern show I've seen two episodes of. It's a pretty great show, But he's kicking the little trash can every time. He just takes crap from right. everybody, but then he just beats the crap out of this one little trash can. Sure. Yep. So you beat 
your PlayStation? It's not a great analogy. That's no. Yeah. It fell apart. Uh, yeah, thanks, Brian. It really <laughs> fell apart. Um, and then another time, uh, I had a big rivalry with a friend of mine, Ronnie, and we we're playing through Harvest Moon Back to Nature on PS One, and we had like competing saves and like, oh, I got a golden chicken that lays golden eggs. Mine's so much better. My farm's better. No, my farm's better. And then he hmm. accidentally saved over my farm. And to this day, I he swear, wins. I guess he his did was it better. on purpose. Yeah. yeah. But he's like, oh, it's an accident. Overgrowth. Yeah, exactly. So Final Fantasy X is one of my favorite games of all time. Sure. Um, and the very first time I played through it, I got stuck near Bavel, where if you like, you know Final Fantasy X, that, that's reasonably close to the end. It's, I think it's the last temple. Um, and uh, yeah, I got stuck right around that part. And I was like, all right, well, I'm just going to take a break. I'm going to start a new file. And that was my mistake because I it, the save screen it defaults you to the top slot whenever Ooh. you go to, so i just overwrote my file completely and i was oh, like no. probably like you know I, I was doing all the side stuff and everything oh, so i was God. loving it the concept that you get hit about a 40 wall. or 50 40 or 50 hours of gameplay just gone the concept that you'd hit a wall in the game and decide like it's time to start a new one i wasn't like trying to like start like a whole new like i guess it was trying to start like a whole new thing but i wasn't trying to like oh this will be like the time i do it right, right. i was just like I, I want like a, a more casual thing using the because i was so sure. into the game i wanted to Keep doing the gameplay without having to fight the same okay. boss over and over All again. Right. I get that. I feel like people who aren't in the gaming industry or into games like look at this kind of stuff. And it's like, oh, boo hoo! You lost a save. It's like, it's fifty hours no, of your a life. A lot of those people don't understand. I've had this conversation with a lot of people, and I think that one of the turning points for people to get into games is, I think, when you beat a video game or two, and you have that huh. sense of accomplishment mm -hmm. where you're like, oh man, this ends, and then I see credits. It's like, sure, I've earned this. And I think there's a lot of people that just don't understand that you earn the endings to video games, and that is a lot of it's the journey, but mm -hmm. a lot of it's the payoff of being like, I'm done, I, I did mean, it. Right. Think about it like in terms of like you know you're writing an essay in college and your computer crashes and it's gone. It's like okay, we'll, we'll just write another one, but right. like the, the satisfaction again of being mm -hmm. done and turning in that finished paper and knowing you did a really good job. It's like exactly. It's it's kind of heartbreaking. Or you're yeah. like an old person who's into gardening, and lightning strikes your yard and it sets on fire. That's true, That's right? Or yeah. you like when yeah. you write that paper and you get an SSS gold on it, mm. and it's just like, oh, thank you, <laughs> Jeff. Here we go. We did that extra life a couple of years ago. Yeah, and we do I, it every year, but yeah. Well, I was on okay. one a couple of years ago. Anyway, so it doesn't exist if I'm not there. That's right. Self-centered. <laughs> it's a lobster piece of, of crap. Mine. All right. Uh, anyway. So I, I brought my Xbox 360 in. I was like, I'm going to finish, um, uh, what was it called? Dark, not Dark Sector. Uh, Dark Void? Not Dark, Dark Void, Dark Siders. No, 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 no. Oh, God. It's the game that you love that people talk about microtransactions, even though they're... Dark, Dead Space 2. Dead Space 3. 3, sorry. 3, yeah. okay. Anyway, it had the D word in it. Anyway, I was like, I'm going to beat this game. So I brought my 360 in and my USB memory stick in somewhere on the way... Back home, I lost that, and it had like oh, 75 no. save games, including oh. like every Lego game to that point, like 100%ed. Yeah. And I was like, ah. And then, but the one that it did not have, this is like the turn of the screwdriver in the chest. Huh? If you're getting stabbed by a screwdriver I got it, in, I got it, in go prison, uh -huh. um, <laughs> is Lefty Lucy. the original uh, Star Wars, like, the original trilogy, whatever video game, whatever that they released on 360, for right? Lego? Lego. Both the Lego one, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, it's like, well, that was at 90, percent so I'm like, oh, screw it, I'm just gonna get the remaining achievements on it. And then, right, my, my older son started a new game over. <laughs> oh man, my old one, so oh. so basically, all my old Lego progress is totally gone. Well, you know uh, what? It's time to leave childish things behind, as uh, the Bible and President Obama once said, <laughs> you okay. need to let it go. Let it go. Okay. Let Lego go. Let thing. Lego go. Yeah. All right. Hey Tim, we should uh, we should start rapid firing these things. We got oh. to get through. Okay. Uh, all right. I think well, you should skip them, but let's go pronto. You, oh, you don't here. want me to skip any of these? No, let's go, man. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Really? All right. I'm ready. Let's uh, go. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts on the way? Uh, okay, this is Dustin from <laughs> Luca, <laughs> uh, Massachusetts. Um, Could I get the GPS coordinates for oh, Luca? <laughs> Iuka is what it has pronounced. Thank you. Uh, what are your thoughts on the way a lot of gaming media and news is shifted towards video content? My favorite thing about Game Informer is replay, by the way. People will forever live in my heart. Also, I'd like to give a quick shout out to Tim's love of video game music between him and Brett Elston of Capcom. Hi, Brett. Um, I've discovered so many awesome tunes. Uh, I had never played or heard of Thunder Force, uh, but I'm still rocking out to Thunder Force 4. Soundtracks, thanks to Tim. Dustin. Well, thank you, Dustin. Uh, Thunder Force has an awesome soundtrack. Um, 
I think that video is cool. <laughs> Next question. So question about the shift of video. I mean, it all comes down to like recommendations on Twitter. That's where I find these articles. And if someone's like, you have to read this long form feature uh, about games, like I'll be happy to do that. Or if it's like, you really need to watch this, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, 70 hour documentary, like the double fun one that you need to get on cork. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, well, I'll be happy to do that too. So, yeah. I mean, as a video producer, I'm a little bit biased, but it makes me a little bit happier to see a shift towards video. As long as it's interesting video. And I know we do a lot of this at Game Informers are a little bit the culprit too, but it's not just, here's another hour, let's play. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. if there's like a nice video documentary about game de like development, I'm, I'm very excited about it. Be honest, if there's a 30 second ad bef before the video, do you watch the entire thing or do you just close it and forget about it? I'll watch it. It depends on my excitement level for the video, really? but most of the time I'll watch it, yeah. My excitement level like falls like it's off a cliff. <laughs> 30 second ads are the worst. How about yeah. you, Brian? Um, I mean, I'm I, because you were biased as a video producer, sure. I'm, I'm biased as a, as a writer and an editor. Um, but, and kind of having a full-time job that wasn't in the games industry before I came to this team, I uh, it was a lot easier for me to read an article like on my phone than have to like sit there with like headphones on and mm -hmm. watch a video like if I saw something cool. So if you have a job that doesn't like you necessarily reading a whole lot about video games at work, that's a much easier way to get away with it. Mm -hmm. um, so now that like you know I, I can look at videos online when I'm working because it's part of my job. I, I, I like watching videos and I, I'm like, I'll peruse YouTube and like other sites that put out videos and it's, it's always entertaining. But if you're wanting to just kind of like get like the, the quick hits, sometimes it's easier to, to read an article. Yeah. Jeff Cork, do you like video? Do you like reading? Do you like I digesting like, games media at all? I like it all. Great. Yeah. <laughs> I'm. A, What's not to like? Cool. I'm in. I'm in Jeff Cork's camp. Sure. I I think it's. Uh, I, under, I understand why we're moving in that direction because it's mm -hmm. just easy to digest, and on top of that, it's easy to to, to digest while doing something else. Right. Mm -hmm. I can play sure. a game while watching and listening to someone's let's play or a podcast mm -hmm. because that I've kind of got over my thing where I'm just grinding around in the world of Witcher or something like that or playing State of Decay. It's perfect for listening to a podcast. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't even have to turn down the audio in the, in the game that much or turn off the music even. And it's yeah. it's it's perfect and videos are, are much the same way. Um, and so. We're going in that direction because those rotten millennials with their noses in the telephones and they can't read <laughs> and they're right. lazy. Oh yeah, keep gosh, it going. Just breathing into the telephones with their noses. Uh, hey, y'all. My name is Dave <laughs> and I'm from Virginia. Hey, Dave. Uh, I want to know your thoughts on the evolution of fitness in video games. With virtual reality becoming a reality, do you think it will hit the levels of that DDR, Wii Fit, and others have with integrating fitness games? Thanks. Not until those headsets weigh nothing. Because I, yeah. those things are going to bobble around, and, and it's just... Or unless you can like go for a run in VR or mm -hmm. something, it's not totally disorienting. Why would you want to? Maybe it's good for the neck muscles. I because guess, but... if you ran on a treadmill... Yeah, um, yeah. I, you <laughs> had to think about it. I really I, had to think about it. I can't it. picture you running on a treadmill. It How is the most you. boring thing. It but really if does I was, suck. If, if I was running from like hordes of zombies, can look over my shoulder, oh, sure. and fall off the treadmill, <laughs> as I did so, it might be cool. Yeah. I don't know. There are, there are iPhone apps right now where you can, you know, you, you download it and it's like zombie zombies run. run. Right, yeah. but it's not the I've same as it. like looking behind sure. you and right. seeing. Oh, you know what it was? If you just had like the scene in Jurassic Park where the T Rex is chasing the Jeep. And but then that was on the trip, and every time I look behind me, if I wasn't running fast enough, the T Rex was getting closer. I think that's an application that could get used. Could you, you to watch your like, body be eaten from the toes up <laughs> <That's right. laughs> slowly? It you takes ten stop. minutes. Yeah. yeah. But could you think about like all the accidents that would happen there? Like you would have to put in some heavy disclaimers in the beginning. Like, oh yeah. Hey, you're gonna fall when you're playing this game on a treadmill. Like Nintendo's like Wii Remote warnings, but it takes ten pages. Yeah. And yeah. Just at GDC, I was playing that one VR demo. I can't remember the game. I feel terrible. It was like an indie game where you're flying like uh -huh. a superhero. I was having a hard time maintaining my balance just from a standing position. Perfect. So I can imagine, like, <laughs> now touch your toes, and I just totally just eat shit. So <laughs> we've got to break my nose. We have a ways to go with that, basically. I can't imagine anything topping, like, the Wii Connect as far as, like, fitness games go. Like, it just seems like it's going to be on the iPhone, it's going to be on your phone, might be on your Apple Watch or some crap. But, like, the idea of, like, VR ushering a new era, I can't see it happening. I think augmented reality would have a better chance where you're punching, like, doing shadow boxing and punching things. Yeah, or trying to do a high kick over something. Or, yeah, like, an obstacle course with things moving towards you, you have to jump over or something. Uh, there's there's so, a lot of more applications. HoloLens more than Oculus. I think so, because you can yeah. kind of still root mm -hmm. yourself in the world. Sure. Uh, okay. Hey, guys, uh, this is Nathaniel. Um... West Virginia. From West Virginia, thank you. Born and raised. Uh, trends in gaming kind of ebb and flow, but with the advent of crowdfunding and different indie initiatives, there's been a boom in 
in those industries um, thought to be left behind, uh, or in those genres thought to be left behind. In an age where there seems to be limitless opportunity for different gaming genres to be developed and not just dictated by market trends, will we ever see gaming droughts for particular game types anymore? Thanks, Nathaniel. I think we have seen so many roguelikes at this point that that will eventually be like people are burnt out on roguelikes. Sure. Oh, so or survival, abundance. Okay, or yeah. survival type games. I think saturation will begat a decline. I like that. I never thought about that because he's coming from the drought angle. Right. Like, oh, there's so many different games out there, but the, this, yeah, the saturation, saturation is what you should be worried about if you really love roguelikes and just everybody burns out on them. I think but so. As far as like the droughts thing, yeah, you can always find some indie developer making whatever specific game type you're super into. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, but you just maybe you're going to miss the AAA production. Like we were talking about with Kim and Joe a couple weeks ago about like AAA turn-based RPG. Right. Which I felt bad for not bringing up South Park, by the way. I didn't realize it until afterwards. But it's a different breed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Than I think most some people extent. think of, but. Yeah. Um, so I think that's about the only route where you'd really miss something that big. Yeah. I mean, some game genres take a lot of money to develop. Like uh, Rock Band and Guitar Hero, for instance, they went away for a few years. Um, yeah. And you need to have, I mean, if you're going like a licensed plastic instrument mm-hmm. type game. Sure. Like, Licensing music is not cheap and right. also having people like putting in an investment to make sure people have like all these instruments is another thing where it's like that that's a huge risk. So um, good use of that cycle. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, like, it sounds like a little less timely because they are kind of rebrand like coming back and everything. We haven't seen them for a while, but if it does collapse again, that's something where indie developers really can't mm-hmm. step mm-hmm. in in any meaningful way if they want to go legit and have licensed music that people actually want to play, not just... Mm-hmm. My friend's in a band, and I've done some chords. Yeah, freeze pop. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it'll be really interesting to see what ukulele does. If that caliber of platformer like launches a new mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. line of 3D platformers, sure. and maybe maybe we'll never see something go away. Maybe the, if certain genres we love will we'll stick around. Mm-hmm. Uh, Logan writes, Hey, guys, I have always been fascinated with the friendships and romances in games. Uh, no matter how good the combat is, I always look forward to getting back to town or back to the ship to check check in with all my companions to see if they have any new dialogue. <laughs> my question is, who was your favorite romance or companion in a game, or both? Uh, mine would have to be Tally in Mass Effect just because of how good her part of the series was and how much she developed as a character between one and two. Uh, thanks. Love the Conker's Bad Fur Day Super Replay, by the way. Logan. Um, I think I am, as far as romance goes, uh, the plant from Conquer's Bad Fur Day, uh, <laughs> the lady from Siberia, and the companion cube. Oh, great. Uh, Cork, when you brought up no, Tally. Those are my answers. I got it. I got, okay, it. got it. All right. Uh, when you brought up Tally, I remember you were talking about the romancing Tally option Mass Effect, and you <laughs> described, oh boy, I can't wait to rub up against her scuba suit. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that visual. That's perfect. I, I mean, it's Brian made the comment earlier, like, it's just Mass Effect. I mean, has anything come close as far as romance options in any other game? I mean, as far as just like companions, uh, the companion cube was pretty cool. Sure, right. it was a completely off the wall idea that worked surprisingly well. Right, aggro. Um, mm. uh, not really a romance option, just more of a companion. Again, uh, I liked the Elizabeth interactions in Bioshock Infinite. I liked sure. uh, Ellie in Last of Us. Right, right. Uh, but yeah, Mass Effect is always going to be at the top of the list for me. Um, I liked, you know, just, you know, picking somebody and developing that relationship and kind of seeing it through all the way to the end. Especially like going over those three games. Like my, I was a Lady Shepherd, and then starting in Mass Effect 1, I was courting uh, Liara. And then in Mass Effect 2, you couldn't uh, romance Liara because you know, she's shadow brokering your test and all that of stuff. Life. Oh, jeez. And it was, it was interesting because I'm like, well, Garrus is a cool guy. Let's see how this goes. <laughs> and so I literally got to the point of Garrus walking into my room with a bunch of flowers. <laughs> like, hello, Shepard. I've been waiting for this. And then <laughs> it was like crawling into my bed Archangel, with this weird cricket Archangel. face. <laughs> and then I was just like, you know what? I think we're good here, Garrus. You can see yourself out. Like, <laughs> and I just turned him down at the last second and it was so satisfying then. To then in Mass Effect 3 have Liar be like, oh, you didn't even cheat on me. Cool. Nice. I was like, yeah, I which, got really close which to is weirdo. What my girlfriend and I say every time we see each other for the day. <laughs> oh, cool. No way. Ah, oh, you too. Did but, Garrus walk away and like chewing on the flowers? The flowers. <laughs> <laughs> That's a yeah. joke. But you talk about like Mass Effect being the prime example and it reminds me of <laughs> on the Mass Effect 3 cover story trip, we talked to Casey Hudson, who's now at Microsoft, which is bizarre, um, who was the creative director for Mass Effect. Mm-hmm. And I asked him like what aspect of mass effect he was most proud of over anything else and immediately he was like the romance 
huh. which I didn't expect. I was pretty like, mm-hmm. oh, the scale and scope of like rec- recording all these choices, but immediately he's like, yeah, no one's done romance as well as we have. The I'm scales really of, of Garrus. <laughs> the scope in his eye. <laughs> scale, and, scale and scope. That's what he's talking about. That's right. Yeah. Uh, uh, Cork, who, who do you love the most? Who do I love the most? I always get kind of creeped out with romance stuff in video games. It's always like a layer removed, like during like the sex scenes in Mass Effect. Like, this is just laughable. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. just like things clipping through things and like <laughs> hair is like, to- it's like just totally plastered. I don't know. Just I don't think the technology is there to make me. And even like like in an action movie when a love scene is jammed in there, I'm like, eh, whatever. Just get this over with. I'm Except gonna... for Terminator 1s, which is just the greatest. Oh, my God. Just wonderful. So, I, so I, gritty. I agree with the Mass Effect answer. I think it's probably one of mine, but I want to point out um, Leisure Suit Larry. Okay. okay. Magna Cum Lauda. Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> the guy game. Sweaty Rob from mm. Snohomish, Washington writes, Why do you suppose consumers are not okay with on-disc content being locked behind additional paywalls, except for when a toy is waved in front of their faces? Oh. You all rock. Look forward to the next episode. So this is like, why why is paying for Skylanders, Disney Infinity, Amiibos okay when yeah. other DLC is not? It's an interesting question. And since Disney Infinity is our cover this month, I've been thinking a lot about that game for the last couple months. <laughs> uh, and just the idea of like, if there were no toys involved and it was that game... And every character was like even one dollar microtransactions. Mm-hmm. People would be outraged, wouldn't they? Oh yeah, yeah. But the toys is it just because the toys look so great with Disney Infinity that it's okay to purchase that because you get to put them on your pretty shelf. Yeah, it's just a thing. I mean, yeah, I was thinking about like from like Splatoon's perspective. Sure. There's a whole thing where you know you 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 unlock new challenges based on the single player levels. If you had to pay, you know, thirteen dollars for each section of those challenges people would be like why why am i paying this but like the fact that you're getting something physical that you can put on your shelf and it doesn't necessarily have to only be used for for that particular sequence of the game yeah. right like if you buy a mario amiibo it it works for smash brothers it works for mario kart it works for, it's it, equally it's, dumb across all games exactly i think it's exciting what brian's saying that like you buy this thing and it's an investment in the future to some extent some um, extent sure. and where skylanders you know oh well i can use this on a skylanders like game in the future mm-hmm, uh mm-hmm. not some completely different genre altogether uh i think part of the magic for me and i know it's so simple but the fact that you know a kid can have it on wii and then, oh man, this is my trigger happy. I love this trigger happy. I'm working mm-hmm. on him. And mm-hmm. go to their friend's house and play it on like Xbox One, like the same character, that that's the cool. same toy. Yeah. That sort of cross platform functionality, I love. I adore it. Mm-hmm. I, I love it. Sure. So, Cork, yeah. are you still going strong with, because you were a big Skylanders collector guy? Mm hmm. Are you still buying like all those toys to life stuff? It's mostly like if one is particularly cool looking. Okay. Point, yeah. Yeah, I like them. And with DLC too, I honestly. It's probably not the most popular opinion, but I treat it like a case by case basis. I don't sure. hold the disc up to the light and go, "Ah, you're right there." It's just kind of like I see what the description is, and it's like, okay, I, I really don't care about buying like a silver beard or like mm-hmm. some kind of gemmed hat. I'm I think not you're interested in a silver that. beard, actually. Oh, come on, you, <laughs> you don't but, need one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it's something interesting. Like, oh, okay, this is a like a little mini campaign. I honestly don't care if it is. Something that I'm like unlocking with like a hundred kilobyte file or whatever. Right. Yeah. And it's case by case too. Like, but yeah, honestly, sure. just like where it comes from doesn't bother me so much. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. Good I'm, I'm more in that that boat than I think a lot of people on Twitter are. Yeah. 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 <laughs> There's uh, a lot of boats on Twitter. Logan Post from thinking. Richville, California, writes in from a boat. Uh, oh, actually, he's on Twitter on the bottom, he labeled his town as something else. Oh, okay. We'll get we'll get to that. At the oh, end. Okay. Do you think nostalgia or love for certain ga- for a certain game in a series can almost corrupt your views of games today? For example, I would argue that a game like the Link, The Last of Us, or uh, Mass Effect are much better than games like Zelda, Mario, or Metroid. I'm assuming they're talking about the first in the series. Right. Uh, games are so good now that people don't appreciate them. Is it because I'm only 19 and the first real memory of gaming for me was the PlayStation 2 and Xbox? I even had. I even had made multiple attempts to play through some of the best old games, and I just don't understand why people think that they're, they're still better than uh, most games today. Thank you for your time, and don't let Ben Hansen answer because no one understands his view of games. Uh, Logan from Richvale, California, a.k.a. Hot Stinkyville. All right, look, I got a lot of thoughts on this, so I'm just going <laughs> to dive right in. Uh, I'm completely in this camp just because I also didn't do much retro gaming back in the day. Um, and so I really think about it, when people are talking about, oh, how great these games are, I mean, clearly just the impact at the time is a gigantic component of that mm-hmm. discussion where it's like, 
And I love the idea of putting those games up against current games just on like fun factor. Like if you want a co-op shooter, you're going to have more fun playing Army of Two Devil's Cartel than Contra. Mm -hmm. I think, I, I mean, I think that there's going to be a, a, a era, like we, we talk about, I want to almost offer the opposite, which is he's talking about like games of today. So we're talking like Uncharted or God of War or something like that. I think if you compare those to games like Zelda or Mario games early on, we're like, you're just always in control of the action. You're always doing something and have direct control over, over the, the things that are happening on screen. Uncharted when, you know, Drake is, you know, squeezing between a wall, like, oh, I got to get through here. All you're doing or is pressing. Or Lara where she's yeah. squeezing between a wall. Oh, going, I need oh, to wade through, through this water. <laughs> oh, hot. oh, cold. Ah. Uh, and, or, or, you know, God of War where it's like, oh, X button, X. Oh, I didn't hit it. Oh, and I'm squished. I think those are things from like <laughs> more nuts. closer to this era that people are going to be like, this is not fun right. what am i doing right now uh so i think that there are examples from every era that makes you know those are great games i mentioned sure but i think those parts of them won't age well whereas i think there's parts of older games that zelda one maybe hasn't aged that well but um the moment to moment eh, i'm not going to defend zelda but, one that much yeah, yeah sure but cork where do you stand on how great these old games actually are compared to current games of today boy i think there are exceptions but i think by and large it is nostalgia sure it's mm -hmm. driving like those, the fond memories just by the very nature of how nostalgia right. works. Mm -hmm. Like, I remember when I was a kid, I played a ton of Kangaroo on the Atari 2600. Like, Good I God. just spent hours and hours playing that. If you were to put that, that in front go? of me now, what's that? How would that one go? You're like a boxing kangaroo, and there were monkeys oh, that were, I had, like, had that your little one. kid. I spent oh. like a ridiculous amount of time hard. playing that. Yeah, it was really hard. And monkeys would throw, they were supposed to be apples. They just look like little squares, but cool. Uh, and what velocity do those apples? No, I'm just, uh, just the, the typical is uh -huh. an apple. But I think if I, if I were to play that now, I'd just be like, I'd play for like 15 seconds and go, like, I'm done. I would I'm love, good. I would love to get like a gymnasium full of monkeys. Kids. Oh. <laughs> and then they'll throw, no, oh, full of kids and just like create this crazy survey where trying to gauge them playing older games and then. Modern games just figure sure. out like it's same genres. What is more fun than what now today? We also have some of those kids react videos. Yeah, I think there's I think yeah. they're sensational and they overreact a lot, mm -hmm. but there's right. still there's yeah. some truth in there somewhere. What's well, funny? Like like a, a lot of parents do have that like the golden path they're gonna have their kids follow. Like gross. I'm right. gonna start with this and then we're gonna go to that. And I think that is a surefire way to make sure your kids just have no interest in video games, because right. I mean, they may not have a, a context like, oh, they, may, they haven't played Last of Us, so obviously they don't have any basis of comparison there. Sure. But a lot of those games just, I think, are garbage You're going to bore, and your kids will grow to hate you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Another reason. Brian? Um, I think it's a lot of nostalgia. Even looking back at, like, series you love, and, like, so I'm a big Sonic fan, and I I've, I remember enjoying some of the, the GameCube Sonic games, like Sonic Heroes and... Even, I mean, regrettably, Shadow the Hedgehog, I, I enjoyed yeah. at the time. And yeah, Brian, then we yeah. went back and played it on replay, and I was like, mm -hmm. what were we thinking? What were we you thinking? What was I thinking? <laughs> I knew what I, was I don't going think anybody, on. aside from me, liked that game Maybe not. at the time. And now it's... I want to yeah. play all the 3D Sonics with you and just watch your childhood shatter in front of your eyes. <laughs> it's already happened multiple oh. times. Um, but yeah, I mean, even like... I, I think a lot of people look back at like the earlier games and series that became better after... like. After a few iterations, they became better, and now people look back at those original games and say, "Wow, that game was so good!" And then, like, you go back and play it. Like, for me, a good example of that is Uncharted One. Mm -hmm. I don't think the sure. first Uncharted game is good at all. I thought a lot of people were pretty realistic about Uncharted One. If you bring it up on Twitter, they aren't. <laughs> I will. Like, I thought that that game was really mediocre I, I, with a lot of heart. In a it. lot mm -hmm. of people gave me crap because I retroactively reviewed it, like while I was trying to get to Uncharted Two, and boy, oh boy, did they hate mm -hmm. me. I'm with you, Brian. I think that game was all Uncharted right. Two and Three. I, I enjoy wonderful. Um, sure. But yeah. Uh, yeah, Uncharted one, not a not oh, a fan of. I'm but sorry. people think I think people look back at that with rose tinted glasses. I'm sorry, I had to put up with that. I am. Uh, um, mm. All right, so that was from uh, that was Logan from uh, Hot Stinkyville. All right. <laughs> um, okay, so Nick from Seattle writes. Recently, I've been going through a tough breakup with a girl I had been planning on proposing to. Sorry, Nick, that's a tough break. Uh, lately, I have been playing a lot of Destiny post breakup to get my mind off things. Traveling to a different world and punching shooting aliens in the face is quite therapeutic. Mm. What are some games that have gotten you through a tough time in your life? Uh, love the new show and keep up the awesome work. Thanks, Nick. I'm trying to work up the nerve to ask uh, Nick's girlfriend to marry me, and so I've been kind of playing some games to kind of get my energy up. Not cool. Not cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <God>. Jesus. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> no, no, but this question, it made me think of like college and uh, freshman year of college was like a really tough time for me. Just like anxiety through the roof. And it's like, I just cannot leave my dorm. And like I reverted back and had some comfort food of playing through Harvest Moon on Super Nintendo again. And then that was also when I played uh, Fire Red and Leaf Green, the Pokemon games with the remake of the so original good, ones. Yeah, so yeah good. they're so good. Yeah, and it's like I never played that remake. And it's like, okay, let me just not worry about feeling guilty for not having a good time at these loud parties. Like I'm just going to sit in my dorm and <laughs> worry about how to get on the SSAN uh, instead. So that was that was my little coping mechanism. Yeah. And then I guess, which seems kind of isolationist, but then I also brought like Super Smash Bros. Melee and then mm-hmm. had a great time uh, with my mm. roommates and like other people just walking by and like little smash tournaments and that's stuff. A, so that's like, a great counter yeah. answer. I think I think mine were like um, at this, around the same time Final Fantasy VIII and uh, Katamari Damacy. Uh, I played Final Fantasy VIII to completion a lot later, and like I was just a, a bummed out time in my life. And I spent a lot of time like I don't regret this part of my life, but like I, I spent a lot of time on like um, like fantasy like role playing chat rooms. Like it was honestly it helped me become a better writer, I think. And I had a really fun time developing these characters and connecting with people mm-hmm. across the world when and people that I still keep in contact with now. Uh, when I was having a hard time connecting, I think with a lot of people in my real life, and I remember. It was a, such an archaic system where you'd have to like type your post like, oh, Jester Shade walks into the in room. He has a trench coat and he has demon eyes. Uh, it was a little <laughs> bit better of a writer than that. He sits down and orders blood wine. I don't know what it was. It was all probably very sad. But uh, and and then I'd have to you just have to hit like F5 to reload and see who it, it wasn't oh, a streaming man. chat. Oh, wow. And so I just turn and play some Final Fantasy eight or Katamari and let like people's responses go and then just pause that and it was just the right balance for that point in my life and so uh, after hours of doing that you felt better oh yeah okay. i mean just being able to play a game in the in the meantime there and it was, it was a those those games helped me out a lot and um yeah I, things turned around yeah I, I mean i've i've gone through some tough times uh related to relationships uh as well and i i think that uh one thing that got me through was rock band and guitar hero um, oh interesting big fan of those games uh really let me like it helped me discover music like my mood gets really tied to music like when i'm listening to something and i think that that was one that helped me a lot because i'd start discovering new music I'd be like, all right cool let me check these guys out and it was like that thrill of like a new discovery of something i love Pretty mm-hmm. much as much as video games. Mm-hmm. Um, That's uh, a great one, though, just to think, like, if you are in a bad mood, a game that literally forces you to sing like Freddie Mercury, like, it will <laughs> shift your mood whether you want yeah. it to or not. Um, Mass Effect, just because you can dive into that world and, like, just completely immerse yourself in the universe. Mm-hmm. Sure. And, you know, find yourself a new girlfriend along the way That's as well. true. That's right. Um, and Call of Duty, it's just junk food gaming, like, the uh, multiplayer, just kind of, mm-hmm. like, you know jump in you you feel instantly better until you suck and then yeah you know it's just it, it's comfort food that's great that's those are great examples you got one jeff when i'm super <laughs> bummed out i don't play video games i just watch tv all right ah, there that's you go. a fair one i also wanted to say it's also a good idea to uh sometimes take a break from video games and go work out and hang out around people oh yeah blowing off uh, steam and like uh, yeah physically is when you're great. when you're bummed out i think that's a great great way to go uh so Jameson from Savannah, Georgia writes in, Hey guys, thanks so much for answering my last question about the game that you'd send into space, like in the, you know, time capsule thing. Uh, and I swear I didn't know it was the plot of an Adam Sandler movie. Thank you, Ben Hansen. <laughs> you have proved I continue to suck at this life thing. I don't think um, that far, but okay. Yeah. Anywho, uh, I'm still trying to get that question of the week mystery box. Um, it's become my Pulp Fiction briefcase. Good reference. A MacGuffin, if you will. Tim, just tell uh, me what's in it. So in hopes... There, people wrote these... Th- okay, it's diamonds. <laughs> uh, so in hopes there is no limit to the amount of questions we can send in, here's another. Uh, usually movies based on video games are disasters. What game do you... What game do you like to see adapted? What game would, would you, like you like to see, see yeah. adapted? And why? Also, uh, who director-wise could oh. pull it off uh thanks for all you do jameson i just said like the whoever does um like american horror story could take a crack at silent hill just do a weird character driven odd even if it's just like one episode uh well you know one story throughout an entire season starring norman reedus yes get him back on that's not bad i mean i feel it's a little bit cliche but i think like a tim schaefer universe would be great uh like Mm -hmm. psychonauts into a uh, TV show or even like Grim Fandango movie, which is mm. weird because Pixar's making a Day of the Dead movie now. Yeah, that's right. Lee Unkridge, like director of Toy Story 3, working on it, but just make it an adaptation of Grim Fandango. It's, yeah. it's the best universe. That'd be a great one. Brad Bird. Uh huh. 
Famous uh, Four. All right. Chibi Robo. Chibi Robo <laughs> from Red Bird. Red Bird's incredible. Oh, okay. It'd be a yeah, Pixar or, adaptation of Chibi Robo. Of Chibi Robo. <laughs> Hope you like vacuum. Did he do, sound did he do Wally, as, Wally as well? No, no. Oh. He also did uh, Ratatouille. Oh. Doesn't that that's a robot that cleans ah. things up? Anyway, uh. um, I'm gonna go kind of straight down the middle here. I think Assassin's Creed, if you got the right team on, could be a pretty cool story. There's some awesome lore behind there, especially sure. the the beginning of that story with um, Desmond. Like Are you excited arc. to see the upcoming movie? Then? No, but I, I think that they, they they could do a really cool thing. I you just don't, don't know anything about it. And you're like, nah. I nah. just don't have faith in it. <laughs> okay. Um, also, Halo, we saw Forward Unto Dawn was pretty sweet. Um, sure. I can't believe I just said pretty sweet. We did. Uh, but yeah, it was it was pretty cool. I think it was even nominated for an Emmy, wasn't it, at some point? I have no idea. Um, it doesn't mean anything. But yeah, it was it it was acclaimed and sure. I, I, it was pretty high quality and I, I think that like the other stuff around Halo has not been fully explored like the the lore so there could be a cool story there. Well, there's Spielberg's adaptations coming up still, right? Uh, and they said it, they announced that and then it's never they said like oh, it's still coming. Yeah, Don't I, let Ridley Scott's I, adaptation yeah. worry mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. Uh, good answers. Good answers. Uh, I, I'm going to read uh, a comment before I go on to the last question. Okay. Uh, uh, hi, I'm I'm Gary and I am really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, read that one. Your delivery is really good. Start it over. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, <laughs> I'm Gary, and I am really liking the the new show format. Keep up the good work. Uh, I'm going to keep bringing up uh, name that that video game tune game until you guys shoot it down or do it. I realize it would be a lot of work, but I think it com- complements the other things you do, like back of the box trivia challenge. I wholly agree. I am we've, so in. Yeah, we've talked yeah. about this. I yeah. really want to do. It. We have like a rundown of like all possible second segments on the podcast. Right. It was in there from day one. Uh, we're gonna do it like name that tune, but yeah. Tim needs to be refreshed on the name that tune. Uh, game show. I can so, name that tune in one boop. <laughs> well, you exactly. get like you get like five seconds, right? You just say the minimum amount of time that you'll need. So they'll give you like that. they give you like some sort of like trivia about like this song was composed by so and so, or it'd be and, like yeah, genre or oh, something like that. So it'd be like the the genre is um, '80s platformers. It'd be like I can name that song in six seconds. This this seems like a very specific format. I've yeah. seen, I've seen and listened to a lot of name that tunes that just. Whoever buzzes in first, sure. Uh, so I'm curious about this one though. I already we'll hate this out. format yeah. that you're using in this okay. future thing. Yeah, it's it's, it's too simple. <laughs> so okay, so we're Gary, think- yeah, we're thinking about we're thinking it. about it. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so this is uh, Alicia from Kentucky. Uh, love the show and enjoyed bringing Bloodstained Kickstarter. I enjoyed you bringing Bloodstained Kickstarter Kickstarter to my attention as it looks great. Uh, got me thinking as to why I fell in love with the Castlevania series and the reason it. The reason at first... Jeff Quirk's really laughing at you, Tim. (laughs) What's going on? I don't know. I... You said kick (laughs) dark. And the wheels fall off. Uh, Listen... I'm, I'm more of a cocktail sauce guy, all right? Yeah. Kick tartar. All right. Love the show and enjoyed bringing Bloodstained Kick Tartar to my attention as it looks great. Uh, got me thinking as to why I fell in love with the Castlevania series, and the reason at first is honestly a little shallow. As a kid, all I had been, all I'd had was box art to guide me, and when I looked at the Castlevania, I found it generic and unappealing with Belmont's design falling flat. Uh, my question is, how much does a, the character design of a protagonist affect your first impression of a game? Have you ever misjudged a game because you thought a character was unappealing? Uh, Alicia from Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you got? Well, we talked about it a little bit last week, but like the Mario and Luigi art style still turns me off. That's what I call it's it. Turn too, off. Too cute. It's too. It's too cute. Yeah. That's right. um, yeah. But I was thinking about one. It's not a character specific art style, but I remember arguing with a friend that he shouldn't buy Condemned because, like, it's just some bloody horror crap. It's a dumb game. Mm. And now, in retrospect, everybody loves Condemned uh, and sees it as, like... <laughs> what were you basing that on? I think it's, like, some podcast discussion I heard once uh, and then, like, the box art. It was, it was so stupid. The it's eye like, take and the it back. chains? Yeah. I was like, this is just It's dumb. bad box art. But, yeah. yeah. Same creative director as Mad Max. Yeah. Your connection to everything. That's right. Um, Frank Rook. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's mine. Um, Bayonetta is the first one that comes to mind. Uh, I just think okay. the the main character Bayonetta looks a little ridiculous. Um, I don't know. It's just a, a little too over the top for my right. taste. What uh, if she was dressed as Star Fox though? Oh man. Hmm. Okay, you sold me. All, All right, right. There it worked. Um, mm-hmm. and then uh, I, I guess Kirby at first. I really huh. I wasn't a fan of like just the pink blob. 
Um, started out yellow. Yeah, that's true. But you know, when I got into to to the Kirby games, you're just kind of like pink and yeah. amorphous. Fair enough. Um, it's a dumb thing to correct you on, <laughs> <laughs> and also not totally accurate. So anyway, Brian, yeah, those are, those are good ones. Bayonetta, Kirby, yeah, I yeah, Brian, Kirby looks dumb. <laughs> Pokemon, I guess, was a, another one that I hey, really didn't like. <laughs> Wait, which I, I one mean, in particular? I, I guess the, the anime kind of turned me off at first. Sure. Um, and then I started watching it, and I was like, all right, I'm all in. Buying all the games, yeah. buying all the cards. Uh, right. But, yeah. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Got one? I do. I bought Mega Man when oh. it came out, sight unseen, and then I opened the box and saw the box. And it was like, oh, boy. You're talking you about didn't, the box art. You the didn't see art. it before you bought it? No, I bought it from like a, a catalog. Oh, like, interesting. Oh. Based on the name. You saw like screenshots and stuff? No. This, I thought it was like a game called Mega Man. It was from a publisher, Capcom, which I knew made great games at the time. And uh-huh. I was like, I'm going to give it a shot. And then the UPS box came and I opened it up and saw that. And that like, man. Oh, boy. <laughs> that not- I have an allowance and I have just completely blown it. But boy, <laughs> were you wrong. Big time. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Yeah, it was shocking. I yeah. can't. I, uh, I know it's probably not a popular uh, answer, but Kingdom Hearts, those characters, oh, sure. I, I yeah. really can't get behind it. Um, and if the gameplay clicked with me more in the first one, maybe sure. that would have changed mm-hmm. it. But uh, it's just, I like the Disney characters, I like the Final Fantasy characters, but something about like their own characters are, if they were just a little more subtle, mm-hmm. the rest of the character design could rise up and maybe pull me in a little bit more. Mm-hmm. But yeah, and that's why I guess I'm so surprised that I like Final Fantasy X so much because the character designs are just ridiculous. They are ridiculous, indeed. especially like what they're wearing, like Maester Seymour. Uh, oh yes, yeah. the oh, fact that right. they ever tried to convince you that Seymour was anything but a bad guy, just based on <laughs> right. what he's wearing alone, it's just like right. I've I've played Final Fantasy. But look, games. if we name him Seymour, nobody will possibly <laughs> right. imagine that he's going to be a bad guy. So we have to name the email of mm. the week. Mm. Yeah, how are you guys feeling on um, this? Deliberations. Deliberations. Yeah, we really got to think about it. Mm. Uh, I, I mean, it, it feel like it's a little bit of a cliche question, but I, I think it's fun to answer. Like, I like the romance one. Okay, uh, mm-hmm. I think that one was all right. Okay, I like the uh, what it, does it take to get a licensed game right question. Okay, mm. um, and I liked the one that asked about separating nostalgia from um, that is a good one. Your favorite series and stuff one. like that. Cork, did you have one you liked? I thought they were all great questions. Oh my gosh, because oh. you did a good job of whittling down. The that cream. was actually a bad oh, answer. Yeah, that was on me, yeah. but thank you, Jeff Cork. Uh, I'll go with... Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll side you, Tim, okay. on the nostalgia one. It's something I think about a lot. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's that, awesome. That's a good choice. So that goes to uh, Logan from Richvale, California, a.k.a. Right. Hot Stinkyville. <laughs> uh, and you can send your emails um, and, and possibly win question mm-hmm. or email of the week by sending them to podcast at gameinformer.com. Um, so keep trying, Jameson, if you really want to know what's in that Pulp Fiction case. Yeah. Yeah. And you can request an apology to something that Ben Hansen <laughs> said this podcast at Game Informer. Maybe it'll get email right. of the week. <laughs> Who can say? That's right. Cool. All right. Well, I think that wraps up this episode of the Game Informer Show, guys. Thank you, Jeff Cork. Thank you, Brian You're Shea. Welcome. Yeah. And You're I would welcome. thank you, Tim, but you can't get out and you're prison here forever. Oh, uh, man. Great. So be sure to tune in next week when we're going to talk about uh, next week's biggest releases. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.